I keep now, trying to put in the ones that don't. That love the red cards. I can see the top of the pipe, which is filled with gravel. Yeah, they, they, yeah. Come, they first, they didn't do well, and then they're coming up from the sprouts being all these down. But the ones I really love are the apples and reds, yeah. the variety. Yeah. Not necessarily. <laughs> I mean, there's a good chance there's gravel underneath your slab, you know, but, you know, if there's gravel in your Please be very careful of the blue wire and the black wire behind you. Gotcha. Do not chew on them. Yeah. See if you can thing out and see what. Maybe it's just to go backfill. I just put it on a cotton ball and wipe it down. It's water soluble. Sometimes you want perimeter. They smell it before they taste it. And they don't want to play No, but you have to cover it with fabric or, you know, or get a good depth of stone over it and just back the top of it. If there's holes on the top side, then that's just silt. Yeah, that's silt works its way down and clogs it all up. I don't know if anybody is good. <laughs> Given a plan for this. Maybe in the day, but today, revised. Oh, okay. Um, so we're not going in this order? Yeah. <coughs> hmm? We're not yeah. going in the order? No, we are. Yeah. No. Well, but the thing these is, two like, present us with so some, much of that is very something out of the ordinary. Kind of on site. So with this one, it was. It's a foundation guy. Yeah, foundation guy would have been one that would have put that in. Yeah, probably. Yeah. And I'm going to run the second. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Which is just a repeat, yeah. so it shouldn't really take. Yeah. I mean, the other thing is that you know, if you don't have a plug yeah, for it, it's fired. Yeah. You know, you have to. Oh, no kidding. Get my fish out of the You might want to go back. Might need to come back. Something that's you know, uh, ideally on its own dedicated circuit. <laughs> All right, we're on. Thank you. Um, good evening. Welcome to the April 18, 2018 regular scheduled planning board meeting, Town of Kennebunkport. Um, tonight we have almost a full, ooh, let's see, almost a full board in attendance. Um, Neil is enjoying some time in Florida, as is Scott. We have four items on the agenda. Um, as far as approval of minutes, we do not have a copy of our meeting minutes from the last, so we'll defer those to the next. But I know that today we received copies of the site walk um, minutes for Binnacle Hill, and has everyone had a chance to review, receive? Yeah? Mm -hmm. Yes. Uh, mm -hmm. Any concerns or conversation or questions? No? No, thank, thank you, motion Mark, to, for doing that. So moved. Motion to approve. Second? Okay. All those in favor? Opposed? Okay. And you did have a chance, Nina? I go? did have a chance to go, but I, I don't know a lot about what happened sure in the minutes. So. Okay. So, so the good minutes. Though, right? Yes. And thank you, Mark, for doing that. You're welcome. Um, 
So we'll start with agenda item number one. It's case number 180202. Seaside Hotel Associates, DBA, the Nonantum Resort. It's a site plan review public hearing. It's rough. rough. For, the, for the approval to tear down an existing garage and storage building, replace with a new storage Four building, minutes. and clean up the parking plan. It's the Nonantum Resort at 95 Ocean Avenue. It's identified as Assessor's Tax Map H Block 001, Lot 13, in the Riverfront Zone. Good evening. Hey, Tina. Hi, how are you? Good. Thank you all for coming out tonight and um, reviewing the information um, that we had submitted. Uh, when we were here last, um, you had requested a clarification on a few um, items. And so I believe that you were um, provided with um, an updated copy. I know you were provided with an updated copy of the amended application to actually reflect um, the information down on the, the lower half, questions 8, 9, and 10, regarding the percentage of lot-occupied structures, where before I had only put no change. Um, and there certainly is a change, um, so I apologize for that. But this is the accurate information that you're looking for. Um, you also had um, requested some updated information on some plans um, for the from the engineer, which have, have been provided to you as well. And then um, we had been asked to speak with the highway department and the tree warden, all of which have been completed. Um, I believe Jeff had spoken with Mike Claus, um, and I had spoken with Mike as well, the head of the highway department, who also reached out to Kurt Moses and um, the chief Sanford um, to talk with them about the proposed seasonal barriers. Um, and after speaking with both of them, um, they provided to Warner an email um, stating that they had no problem with the um, proposed changes to our parking situation. Um, with in regards to the seasonal parking. I spoke with Pat Briggs um, in the tree warden um, who <clears throat> reviewed the information that was um, on the plan as well as um, he came over to the property and we um, looked at it together. And he s really didn't give any um, indication as to specifics on the trees. Um, he did indicate that he thought we might want to consider planting more shrubs than trees to avoid ma maintenance issues down the road. He did suggest perhaps a Bradford pear, which um, would be aesthetically pleasing, offering some flowerings and whatnot. But he thought that we would be um, smart to just go with the recommendation of our landscaping department and the landscaper who does the actual installation. Do you have any questions? <clears throat> So everyone had a chance to re receive the amended application, all that additional documentation. Mm -hmm. <coughs> mm -hmm. um, any questions for Tina? No. No. Okay. Right. Hearing none from the board, I think we'll open up the public hearing. Um, are there any abutters who wish to speak or ask questions of the Nonantum? Seeing none, are there any members of the public who wish to go up and speak or ask questions of this applicant? We'll close the public hearing. Um, Mark, were you the case manager on this one? Yes. Thank you. Um, I, I did have a couple of concerns as I write these findings up. Sure. Um, one thing is, I was re-looking at this. Um, so are we looking at two different lots? There, Seems like they're separated from the. I'm wondering about the justification for transferring parking spots from one lot to another. Um, is that what we're saying? I, 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 find, sorry, I think of in my um, of in just offering my opinion of what the the his, historical information of what I have. Um, <coughs> taking a look at, yes, it is, Warner, <coughs> please correct me if I'm incorrect, it is two separate lots um, on you know, two different maps, if you will, mm -hmm. um, with common ownership. Yeah. And so the requ as history has shown um, ever since the Portside building was approved and built before any of us landed on the scene, um, all of both lots have been considered one in talking about the total parking plan and the justification in order to support the building of the, the actual erection of that building. And so as we move forward, we realize that this is um, a non-conforming use um, that was approved by a, a select board or planning board years ago. 
And so what we're asking is if we can modify um, this non-conforming use. We're not asking to add any additional parking spaces. We're saying we want to have the same amount of parking spaces that's allowed um, under the, the different um, codes. Mm -hmm. It's just modifying that plan on the other side of the road. What, what it, it you just, have, what so you you have Mark, is you have a modification to a previously approved plan. So you okay. have a previously approved uh, parking plan uh, that the planning board approved in you know, whatever that date was. Yeah, 90, 98. Yeah. Yeah. And so in it's that sense, that you every are time dealing with we, parking spaces we deal with the, on, the, on the water side that are... Right, but they are two different lots. I mean, what's to say if that other lot wasn't three miles away, could you still do that? I mean, with, just because it's the same ownership. I'm just trying to grasp this. Um, because on that lot where they want to increase the non expand the non-conforming use, um, parking isn't allowed. So they'd be increasing the, they'd be um, increasing the non-conformity. And it's a separate lot. That's, that's what I'm just trying to grasp. It's same ownership, I understand, but. So, I mean, the ordinance does allow, if you look at your parking standards, it allows for the planning board to consider uh, joint parking on separate lots when uses are within, you know, when the lots are within 100 feet of each other. Okay, can you email me that so I can? Sure. Okay. I'm all set. Thank you. Ed or Nina, any questions? Concerns? No. I mean, I know the parking spots were um, meant to be created when they did the addition. But a lot of them, it wasn't enforced. A lot of them have never been used. So that was the other part of it. And the ones they want to transfer over across to the other lot have never been used. It's, they're literally between the, the river and the pool. That's why I wanted to make sure we're doing this right. Are you worried about grandfathering? No. Okay. No, they are grandfathered. So. So, so Mark, the... The non-conformance um, of, of the lot that the application is for, one is is that there's parking there, mm -hmm. right? And that use has been allowed. Right. Uh, aren't there other non-conformances of that lot? For, for example, the structure that's going to be taken down, it looked to me like it didn't uh, adhere to the setback requirements. Mm -hmm. But but so, so in a sense, you're reducing if, if, if that's true, it seems like you're reducing that nonconformance. Um, I'm not sure if there's other nonconformances of that lot, but it, it, it almost looked to me like, can, can you look at this lot in and of itself and say, I'm trading one well, nonconforming, I've got a nonconforming lot and I'm going to change it to another non-conforming use of um, it's it's non-conforming by use parking only public yes. parking lots are allowed in that zone right and so that's so by adding fine. one more parking spot they're exp they're expanding that use is that right is that which is I'm, why I'm, they I'm not <coughs> I'm not sure that I I've <clears throat> on that one I lot across the that. street yeah they have parking which is grandfathered mm -hmm. um but it's non-conforming. You can't have private parking in that zone. By increasing it by one parking spot, they're expanding the use. Not the coverage, not the setbacks, um, the parking use. But if Werner has that thing about two lots I don't my near each other. I, I didn't understand that to be an expansion of use. Yeah. But with, with I, I, I thought Werner said. 8.8, .8, expansion of a non-conforming use is prohibited. And what, what does it define an expansion of a non-conforming use as? Parking space. One parking space would be an expansion as far as I'm concerned. I see. Um, and on that lot, I don't even know what the zone, it, the, uh, the main hotel is on. I don't even know what zone that is. Riverfront. But, Riverfront. but this is village, yes. residential. I understand. Across the street. It's a different lot. Um, <coughs> and... Parking is prohibited, okay. but Park it's grandfathered. Parking is not prohibited on that lot. 
because it is grandfathered. But that otherwise it's prohibited. Is allowed. Uh, you, you couldn't start a new parking lot in that zone. I, I understand. And, and it, it, even if it was in a zone where parking was allowed, it, it, uh, there's some so, visual barriers that would have to be there, the, the, the particular location of some of the, yeah. some of the, some of the uh, spaces uh, would be different. All of that, t to me, is grandfathered. So you may want to look at your definition of expansion of use, that's just because it seems like that's where you're, you know, maybe just having some struggles with could, that. Could you read that? Uh, so the expansion of use uh, definition is the addition of one or more months to a use's operating season, or the use of more floor area or ground area devoted to a particular use. So, so this would definitely devote more ground area to the use of parking. Yeah. So I think that's, oh, you know, that's that the okay. you know that's the question that you know that you have to answer, and, and, right? And you can't and I think expand what it on conforming. What you're use. looking at is the the amount of coverage that's been devoted right. to parking. Would the zoning board have jurisdiction over this? Well, I think you know the, if you've come to the conclusion that the coverage isn't increasing, and ultimately if the coverage calculation is based in you know your area. You know I think that's that's a question. I think that's a question that you have to to work through. Right. I mean we're not asking to um, expand coverage. Actually, reducing coverage. We're um, asking for a modification of an existing parking plan. Mm -hmm. So. You know, we've chatted about this earlier, but <clears throat> there are there has been parking across the street from mm -hmm. the hotel for quite some time. There's paved parking, mm -hmm. and then there's parking that has occurred in grassy areas next to trees or across the street or over the park, over the, um, over the curb, mm -hmm. I guess, if you will. And so, correct me if I'm wrong, but the proposal is to provide for paved parking spaces with stormwater, with drainage. Correct. Um, and to prohibit parking where it may have happened before on that piece of property, such as on the grass across the street. Correct. Um, and be, as one whole property across the street in the grassy areas um, with events, fundraising events, things of that nature, mm -hmm. there has been parking because of crowds, which um, for fundraising is a good thing. Um, that parking, or the need for that, won't be there anymore with the ability to have some paved parking spots over here? Correct. Right. So, so Russ, you're, you're saying that one of the conditions is to uh, somehow prohibit parking on these areas on the riverfront side, where, where we really don't want parking up close to the river. And, and it doesn't happen all the time, but is there a viable way of prohibiting it during events? Oh, absolutely. Well, it's gated, so. It's right. Oh, it's gated. Mm -hmm. I didn't understand that. Yeah, there's a gate there that um, if we need to open it up, we certainly can. Um, but as a standard, we keep it closed off because those are supposed to be the, la the very last resort of what we use for parking. Right. Didn't mention that. Oh. But Sorry. I think what Mark is getting at is you've got two lots. Yeah. And even though... In the past, historically, it's been treated as one lot. You have two lots in two different zones. And you've got the village residential zone where you want to make modifications. And looking at that village residential zone, you've got an expansion of use that is prohibited. And how do you handle that? Um, and we recognize that taking the parking from the riverfront zone is a good thing. But whether it's good or bad, you're basically mm -hmm. you're getting an expansion of use over at the other lot, which is prohibited by the zoning ordinance. I mean, it seems the right thing to do, but when you read the ordinance, the ordinance doesn't allow it. Right. <clears throat> so it's a little more objective. So I'm kind of stuck. I mean, I, I think they should have the parking. Yeah, I think everybody here wants to give yeah, them a parking. Exactly. There's no question about it. The question is, does the planning board have the authority to do that? Yeah. 
um, to make that kind of a waiver. But if Werner's mm -hmm. reference to proximity. Well, the, you know, the, the proximity language there is, you know, I don't, I don't know that that gets, I don't know that that gets you there. Mm -hmm. You know, what the proxi, you know, the, the proximity language, what that allows is it, you know, it allows us to, you brought up the question of, well, if they happen to own a property three miles away, did that count for parking? And uh, the piece that talks about proximity allows for the board to look at uh, joint parking between multiple principal buildings. Uh, so in other words, if you had, yeah, I mean, if you had two businesses and you had one that had, that had excess parking and they were within 100 feet of each other, then you could, you know, conceptually you could, re uh, you could review a lease arrangement that would allow for uh, some parking from one property to be allocated to another property as long as they were within 100 feet of each other. So it's, it's just it's a joint parking, you know, allows for mm -hmm. joint parking. Uh, so that, that was my reference was okay. related to your question about, you know, if they owned property, you know, a number of miles away, would that count? Mm -hmm. uh, I think some of the other language that you can look at is under your non-conforming use section where it talks about changes of use, you know, from one non-conforming use to another non-conforming use, uh, you know, allowing the board to make a determination on adverse impacts, you know, if one is less, uh, you know, as long as there's no, you know, where, Where's that again? That's in Article 8.8. 8.8C. Okay. And one sentence you might look at is in shoreland zones, the determination of no greater adverse impact shall be made according to criteria listed in 8.4. Okay. Um, and you're going to have to make a justification for that. Okay. Yep. Basically, I, think I remember I remember reading that before. Yep. So I think that, you know, that's part of your deliberation can be whether or not in Article 8, whether you use some of Article 8.4, to justify mm. removal of parking that is today is non-conforming to setback. I mean, you know, you couldn't you couldn't create that parking in the riverfront zone uh, that close to the water mm. today. Right. You know, and so you have some right. legally non-conforming, you know, parking mm -hmm. that's there. Would but if you this consider was... that a waiver? No. No. Okay. No, I wouldn't consider that a waiver. What one thing I'd offer is it seems to me that what one thing that is grandfathered is the coupling of the parking between the two lots. That notion of in balance, no Nantum required a certain number of spaces in order to justify the building, et cetera. And that balance was worked out between the two lots. So I think there's a there's a precedent in a grandfathering of the coupling. Now I think we need to look at the change of one non-conforming use to another and whether or not it's justified uh, on the basis of, what does it say here? No greater adverse impact. impact yeah. Which I is would, what? I mm. would use that language. Okay. I, yeah, I, I remember that. That's, I remember that's that, where yeah. we Thank need you. to be looking. But you, you could see how if it was all one lot, one real lot, <laughs> And, and if those parking spots had actually been used in the past? Now you know why no one wrestled you for the case manager task of this particular <laughs> one. And, um, okay. Could, could we put in a condition of maybe eliminating that whole row of parking that's like five feet from the river? I'm referring to that map from 1995 or something. Um, I, I think... Do you guys have we, we have to ask that? Tina that, but I think she's got some requirement right. in terms of the total number of spaces that we were justified on an, you know, um, on another need. We yeah, do, that. If we, if we were to do that, though, Mark, uh, one issue would become, where are we here? So we'd be looking at, oh, I'm sorry. So we'll actually want to look at it this way, whereas the river is going to be right down mm -hmm. here. If you were to eliminate that whole row there, which... Again, would it certainly yeah. be ideal if it would still be two, three, four, five, six. That would reduce 11, 11 yeah. spaces, which would either be 44 seats yeah. in the dining room, okay. 11 guest rooms, etc. I don't disagree. I was trying to look at which would be the one yeah. that would be the most impact because this okay. is down by the marina. Very good. I guess one last question or point of clarification for me is I recall in previous discussions that the 
so parking across the street, typically immediately across from the front door. Yes. It happens with guests and whatnot. Um, your staff have to park somewhere and um, have, I'm sure, parked in various locations. The parking that we've talked about here, you've mostly mentioned is for your staff to park. Um, up on top of the hill, On correct. top of the hill, yeah. yes. Okay. Um, so I, I just, I think that's a matter of just something worth discussing as well, or noting that this isn't, the parking there is, is less to just bring more people in and, and, and fill it. It's more to allow those who come to visit to park near the hotel or the restaurant. Well, um, and to provide for a safer parking area. And a safer parking yeah. yeah. Um, so that it, I, that was um, something, and I noticed also in the in the village residential zone, there's overflow public parking allowed, and I think that probably serves more of that type of purpose or has in the past, at least immediately across the street. I like I'm not trying to find my way to the solution, but it just it makes sense, and I think Mark, you're asking great questions around just making sure mm -hmm. um, as we go through this and create a findings of fact and vote on it that. Um, that we're calling out the right sure. areas. <clears throat> so, are there any any other questions or okay? So Mark is the case manager. Okay. Um, and probably want to um, work on some findings of fact, which sure. we can review at the next meeting. Sure. He can share those with us. We as a board can vote on the overall project. Okay. So, and um, depending on how that goes, vote on the findings of fact. Sure. Okay. Do you have any questions that you might want to ask? I do have um, our engineer here and the architect as well. John and Jeff are both here. If you have questions for either of them. I'm okay. Okay. Uh, okay. I think we're good. Okay. Good. Thank you very Thank much. You. Thank you. Did we close public here? I do. Oh, okay. Okay, no, 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 no
from the previous one, so I'm pretty much all set. Yeah, it's pretty much all set the last time. Do we have to have a public hearing? I think we probably do. Okay. Let's, let's see what just, else other people have to say first. Just, just one comment. Um, you put together a very nice package here, but there's one thing missing from it. When you come for a resubmittal, it really helps if we have a copy of the findings of fact from the original submittal. Good point. Okay. I apologize. That wasn't in there. Um, right. The engineers put the package together for me, and I assumed that was in there. Okay. I can supply that. If I've you. got it, and uh, Lisa has it in the office, so okay. if anybody wants it. But, you know, yeah. it helps to summarize what we went through last July because we've been through a lot of applications since then. I understand. And there's some new members. And there are some new members. <laughs> <laughs> you remember? <laughs> yep. Yeah, we can do that. We can, I mean, we can email a copy of that to the board. That'd be super. That'd yep. be good. Okay. So with that, is the, is the application complete, Tom? Is that what the... I think, I believe the application, well, we have to vote on it, but I believe the application is complete. The question is whether we really need a, an, another public hearing on this topic or not. And I don't know what the... What what the what, what do you say, Warner? What do well, we do normally? That's up to the board. I mean, you uh, I mean you have the authority to make the decision as to whether or not you want to waive a public hearing uh, for it or not. So, do you recall was there any if anyone showed up at the public hearing last time? No, I don't think mm -hmm. we did. <laughs> so. So. Well, then I would suggest hearing. Nothing else that maybe we just approve, reapprove it at this point. I'll make a motion to reapprove the application. Okay, I'll second it. All in favor? I think I'm going to abstain on this, not knowing anything. <coughs> well, I was going to assign you the. No. <laughs> Thanks, buddy. <laughs> I, I think that's fine. Okay, well, it's got three votes. That's, that's enough. And uh, so. We do need a new a, a new finding of facts associated with this. Yeah, I can. Uh, you know, we'll email you the the findings. Or uh, did you pick a case manager for it? I'll take it, Tom. That's okay. Yeah, so we'll get you the copy of it, and um, yeah, I think we just need to add some language in there regarding that it was previously approved. Probably the book and page number uh, okay. for it. Cool. And then you know, revise the dates and uh, make sure the ownership information because the ownership information is. Different, I think. Uh, Dave, if I remember correctly, you did the initial one under a purchase and sales. Correct. Uh, and then now it's owned by uh, an LLC. Correct. So, yeah, so I just want to make sure that those details are correct. Okay. Yeah. That sounds a lot easier than other things we've been doing. <laughs> very good. Okay, so I guess uh, thank you. Thank you very much. I appreciate it. I normally explain myself. My wife represents Dave in the sale of property, so that's why I sat back there. Yeah. Um, case number three is <clears throat> 171201 at Sandy Pines Campground, Sebago Technics, authorized agent, site plan review. It's the findings of fact. <coughs> Sorry. It's for approval for facility upgrades and to improve pedestrian and vehicular safety to the operational component of the campground, as well as relocation of campsites and other site work. Its address is 277 Mills Road, Assessor's Tax Map 32, Block 1, Lot 3, in the Goose Rocks, Shoreland, and Resource Protection Zones. So at our last meeting, um, if I recall, that was a doozy. That brought us right up to 10 o'clock. Um, we deliberated for quite some time. We had town council here. Um, we conducted sort of a straw poll review of um, Article 1010 um, and uh, talked through the first draft of the findings of fact. And there was quite a bit of feedback and, and great discussion and deliberation. So my thought was for this evening, 
that um, Ed, we would ask you to go through the findings of fact as they are today with the feedback and review them verbatim, yep. have board discussion, and if uh, and at the conclusion of that discussion, if the board feels as if we're in a position to offer a vote on the project and then subsequently the findings, that um, we would kind of follow that path. Any other thoughts or ideas on that? No? You need a glass the, of water? The only thing I'll... <coughs> That you've sowed the seed now. <laughs> but the the only thing I'll uh, I'll add to that is the only changes that are made to this from the last reading are the changes that we agreed to, mm -hmm. uh, with the exception of the fact that I added the date of the last meeting in yeah. to, to keep the list, and I changed the signing date to optimistically believe that it might be tonight. Right. Uh, other than that, there should be no surprises. And okay. a copy of this was sent out to the members uh, in case there was an error that they could catch and I, I received no no feed, no such feedback so yeah should be no surprises okay Ready? well you didn't ask for feedback to be sent to you I asked if there were any errors I didn't errors. ask for feedback right. we'd already done the feedback to, to my way of thinking oh, okay okay and and I Offer it in that same spirit. <coughs> so I'll go ahead and read this. So would you like some water? <laughs> <laughs> we'll, we'll try without. If you do, just wave. I'll go get ne you some. Nina has uh, offered me a candy, which is which is very nice. <laughs> okay, thank you, Ed. Applic uh, Kenny Bunkport Planning Board findings of fact and decision on the application of Sandy Pines Campground, 277 Mills Road, Kenny Bunkport, Maine, 04046. Following site plan reviews pursuant to the Kenny Bunkport land, land Use Ordinance held on 3 and 17 January, 21 February, 21 March, and 4 April 2018, the public hearings held on 17 January, 21 February, and 21 March 2018, the Kenny Bunkport Planning Board makes the following findings in fact and conclusions and renders the following decision subject to the conditions enumerated below. Finding of facts are as follows. The applicant is Sandy Pines LLC, quote, Sandy Pines, or quote, applicant, with a mailing address of 2 Livewell Drive, Suite 201, Kennebunk, Maine, 04043. The property has a street address of 277 Mills Road, Kennebunkport, Maine, 04046. The property is identified as Map 32, Block 1, Lot 3, on the Municipal Tax Assessor's maps. The property is located in Goose Rock Zone, with a portion of the property in the Shoreland Zone, the 250-foot buffer, and Resource Protection Zone, Coastal and NWI Wetlands. The applicant is author has authorized Sebago Technics, Inc. of South Portland, Maine, to prepare the application and act as their agent for this matter in a later letter dated 11 December 2017. The applicant was represented by Stephen Doe of Sebago Technics, along with Ralph Austin Esquire at the proceedings. The applicant has demonstrated a legal interest in the property by providing a quitclaim deed recorded in York, York County Registry of Deeds, Book 17640, pages 501 through 503 on 9 January 2018. The property comprises 46.25 acres, more or less, it includes 324 campsites, a lodge, general store, approximately 4,100 square feet, a two-bedroom employee residence, approximately 880 square feet, and a guest swimming pool. Eight, although conflicting evidence was reviewed regarding the number of campsites historically on the property, which included evidence that the number of sites may have ranged from 225 to an excess of 400, the board concludes that there is substantial evidence in the record that the current number of campsites is 324 and that the number of campsites historically on the property since the mid-80s on the whole has exceeded 300. The conclusion is based on a variety of evidence, including from the campground websites and advertisements, the affidavit of Stephen Doe dated March 12, 2018, anecdotal evidence from public comment, archival sites, 
and assessor's records. The applicant's engineer, Mr. Doe, walked the site in 2016 and located 324 campsites. The location of these sites was placed on a plan and submitted to the code enforcement officer slash planner who, upon walking the site in 2016, confirmed the existence and approximate location of the 324 sites. In March 2018, Mr. Doe spoke to Michael Spang, a family member of the property's former owner who confirmed that no new campsites were added after 1985. See Stephen Doe affidavit dated March 12, 2018. Nine, since purchasing the property in 2016, Sandy Pines has completed a number of site upgrades and improvements to the existing campground, which have been per permitted as required through the Planning Code Enforcement Officer, uh, through the Planning Code Enforcement and or Plumbing Inspector's offices, including improvements to the existing Welcome Center slash General Store, the Manager's Office and bathhouses, extending a six inch seasonal public water main up Mills Road and into the site, adding new septic waste disposal systems for 136 sites, upgrading power, cable, and Wi-Fi services, adding site lighting, regrading, and resurfacing gravel roads within the campground, improving existing sites and landscaping. 10, the property is legally non-conforming. The property's use as a campground Pete predates the Kennebunkport Land Use Ordinance, LUO, which does not include a campground as an allowed use in the Goose Rock Zone. As a legally non-conforming use, the seasonal campground use of the property may continue to exist but may not be expanded. See Section 8.8A of the Land Use Ordinance. Also, an existing non-conforming use may not be changed to another non-conforming use unless the proposed use has no greater adverse impact on the subject and adjacent properties and resources than the former use, as determined by the Planning Board. See Land Use Ordinance Section 88C. The campground's total area of 4635.64 square foot per campsite per data of the applicant is below the 5,000 square foot per campsite required by Article 7.3.A.1 of the Land Use Ordinance. Existing lot coverage in the shoreland zone is 43.5% per the site plans included with the application. This is above the 20% maximum required by Article 4.17.A.5 of the Land Use Ordinance. D. 76 RVs or camping trailers have historically remained on their campsites year-round as determined from information submitted by the applicant based on aerial photography which was reviewed with and confirmed by the, the code enforcement officer. This is contrary to Article 7.3.8.3 of the Land Use Ordinance, which requires that no RV, trailer, or tent be allowed to remain in a campground on a permanent basis. In E, the 100-foot setbacks and 25-foot visual screens required for campgrounds by Article 7.3.C of the Land Use Ordinance are not met along some of the property's exterior lot lines as shown on the site plans included with the application. 11. In a revised application dated January 11, 2018, Sandy Pines proposes to make the following general categories of changes to the campground located on the property. A. Modifications and improvements to the campground's main entry area for improved safety, operations, and maintenance. B. Reconfiguration of the glam tent slash beach rose area of th within the campground. C, installation of a new bathhouse in the central recreational area of the campground. And D, relocation of certain pre-existing campsites. These proposed changes are described further in item 14 below. Specifics of the changes are provided in the site plans submitted by the applicant and described further in item 14 below. 12. This application presents the Planning Board with its first opportunity to review the project since the applicant purchased the property in 2016. The Planning Board has the authority to determine whether the specific proposed site improvements and modifications contained within the applicant's application should be approved based on a review of the overall proposed use of the site as a whole. 
The Planning Board has the authority to consider in its review of this application whether the proposed use of the property as a whole constitutes an, an expansion of or a change to a non-conforming use. See Land Use Ordinance Sections 88C, 102A3, 10.4, and 10.10.A.1.A. .10 .A. 13. In addition to the site plan application package submitted to the Planning Board on the 11th of January 2018, the applicant has submitted the following supplemental submissions. A through G. First, <coughs> RE Site Plan Application of Sandy Pines LLC, a letter from Ralph Austin Esquire to the Planning Board on the 14th of March 2018 regarding the number of campsites. B, Affidavit of Stephen Doe, 12th March 2018 regarding the historical number of campsites. C, regarding Sandy Pines Site Plan, a letter from Ralph Austin Esquire to the Planning Board, 12th March 2018 regarding various aspects of the application including proposed conditions in response to public comments. D, supplemental submission of the Sandy Pines Campground, a memo from Stephen Doe to the Planning Board, 14 March 2018. E, the site plan drawings for Sandy Pines Campground, sheets one through nine, revision C, 14th of March 2018. F, Sandy Pines Campground, Campground Site Area Calculations Revised, Memo from Stephen Doe to the Planning Board, 28 March 2018. And G, the overall site plan, Sandy Pines Campground, site plan drawings for Sandy Pines Campground, Sheet 2 of 9, went to Revision D, 28 March 2018. 14. In an application dated 11 January 2018 and as described in the site plans revised on 14 and 28 March 2018, the applicant proposes specifically the following. A, to make the following changes in the Welcome Center main, air, main entry area. I, make the existing driveway exit only. Two, add a new entry driveway with a separate lane for stacking arriving vehicles during registration. Three, add a new six by eight gatekeeper shed to facilitate check-in during peak periods. Four, remove the existing security gate and landscaping in the gate area. Relocate the existing entry and exit lanes and add a new security gate. Five, install a new bituminous pedestrian sidewalk along the exit lane. Six, Modify the existing visitor parking area as shown on the site plan, adding new seashell sea surface as required. Seven, reconfigure the existing grass parking area in the area historically used for overflow campsites over the existing septic field. Eight, rotate the orientation of the existing park model and modify its visitor access. Nine, add an evergreen visual buffer along the property line behind the grass parking area and park model. 10. Add a three foot wide seashell walkway between the gate area, the park model, and the reconfigured grass parking area. 11. Place a new 16 by 20 maintenance storage shed in the service area behind the welcome center slash general store and expand the gravel yard to accommodate it. 12. Remove the existing woodshed and build a new 16 by 23 woodshed near the Welcome Center General Store accessible through the service area. 13, place a new 10 by 10 storage shed in the service yard for store use. 14, pave the existing bark mulch walkways by the pool with stone or pavement. Now B is to make the following changes to the Glam Tents Beach Rose area. One, remove four tent sites Add four new glamp tent campsites. Relocate two existing RV sites from the glamp tent area to the nearby adjacent RV area. Two, modify the existing glamp tent cooking area per the site plan drawing. Modify the glamp tent common parking area per the site plan drawing. And now C, to build a new bathhouse in the central recreation area. A new five stall bathhouse would be constructed near the open field near bathhouse number four. 
The applicant has provided an email from Al Frick Associates dated 30 November 2017 that explains that the plumbing code allows this new bathhouse to be added without expanding the existing septic system. The new bathhouse would have only toilets, no showers. D, to reduce the total number of campsites from 324 to 300. This would increase the total area of the property per campsite to 5,000 square foot, more or less, and bring the property into compliance with Article 7.3.8.1 of the Land Use Ordinance per data provided by the applicant. A campsite summary has been provided as part of the application showing both existing and proposed campsite locations, including the sites to be eliminated. Item 15. The applicants have requested no submission or performance waivers from the requirements of the Kennebunkport Land Use Ordinance. 16. Pursuant to the requirements of Article 1010A1 of the Land Use Ordinance, Guidelines for Decisions, the Planning Board shall approve a site plan application unless it makes a negative ruling on one or more of the following identified findings, which would otherwise compel denial. A. The proposed use meets the definition or specific requirements set forth in the land use ordinance and will be in compliance with the applicable state law, state or federal laws. The finding is yes. Comments are that the board finds, with the accompanying conditions of approval contained herein, the applicant's proposed project does not constitute an improper expansion of the legally existing non-conforming campground use of the property. The property remains seasonally operated and serves fewer campsites than were present on the property historically. The changes proposed by the applicant in its site plan application are modernization improvements to the facility which do not alter the essential character of the property as a campground. The entire 46.25, more or less, acre site has been and remains in use as a campground. There has been no increase in ground or floor area devoted to current campground use <clears throat> nor an increase in the campground's operating season, which remains seasonal. The board also finds that the applicant's site application and associated improvements to the property do not constitute a change of the legally non-conforming campground use to another non-conforming use. The changes proposed by this application would not increase the property's non-conforming conditions, satisfying Article 8.1 of the Land Use Ordinance. One. The proposed changes would not expand the property's grandfathered use as a campground. Two, the proposed change to reduce the number of campsites from 324 to 300 would increase the total area per campsite, bringing the property into conformance with Article 7.3.8.1 of the Land Use Ordinance. Three, the proposed changes would not affect lot coverage in the shoreland zone. Four, the proposed changes would not affect the grandfathered maximum number of RVs or camping trailers, 76, that are left on site at the end of the season. And five, the proposed changes would not eliminate the existing setback and visual buffer nonconformances. However, a new evergreen buffer is proposed to be added along the property line in the entry area, and the proposed new structures would meet the 100-foot setback requirements for campgrounds by Article 7.3.C of the Land Use Ordinance. Item B, the proposed use will not create fire safety hazards and will provide adequate access to the site or to the buildings on the site for emergency vehicles. Finding is yes, none of the changes pose fire safety hazards. The proposed changes in the entry area improve vehicle access and parking. C, the proposed exterior lighting will not create hazards to motorists traveling on adjacent public streets and is adequate for the safety of occupants or users of the site and will not damage the value and diminish the usability of adjacent properties. Finding is yes, only incidental lighting within the interior of the campground is proposed to be added. Item D, the provisions for buffers and on-site landscaping provide for adequate protection to neighboring dock properties from detrimental features of the development. Finding is yes, the proposed changes meet the 100-foot setback requirements of Article 7.3C 
and an evergreen visual buffer is proposed to be added along the property line in the entry area. E, the proposed use will not have a significant detrimental effect on the use and peaceful enjoyment of abutting property as a result of noise, vibrations, fumes, odor, dust, glare, or other cause. Finding is yes. The proposed changes in the entry area reduce the likelihood of entering vehicles backing up onto Mills Road. The applicant has proposed signage in the entry area asking vehicles awaiting registration to turn off their engines in order to minimize noise, fumes, and odor. In addition, the campground is prohibited from hosting activities with amplified musics, such as bands, karaoke, DJs, after 10 p.m. as a condition of approval. F, the provisions for vehicle loading and unloading and parking and for vehicular and pedestrian circulation on the site and onto adjacent public seat streets will not create hazards to safety. The finding is yes. Proposed changes to the entry area improve vehicle and pedestrian circulation and safety and reduce the likelihood of entering vehicles backing up onto Mills Road. G, the proposed use will not have a significant detrimental effect on the value of adjacent properties which could be avoided by reasonable modification of the plan. The finding is yes. Although the proposed changes in and of themselves would not have a detrimental effect on the adjacent properties, some concerns were raised during the public hearings about the continued existence of a campground as a grandfathered use in the environmentally sensitive Goose Rock Zone. To mitigate these concerns and following recommendations raised during the hearings, the applicant has proposed the following, which are included in the conditions of approval contained herein. One, the applicant shall perform all site work on the property under best management practices. See Maine Department of Environmental Protection documents listed in the conditions of approval section below. The applicant will use only organic fertilizers and pesticides and will not use any fertilizers in the shoreland zone areas. Three, the applicant will use native plants in the landscaping to the extent practical. Four, the applicant will inspect and clean the septic systems on a regular basis and provide copies of the inspection slash cleaning records to the code enforcement office. Inspection will be performed on a yearly basis at a minimum. Five, the applicant will fund the Healthy Beaches water testing programs in Kennebunkport in the amount of $2,500 per year, as long as that program exists. H, the design of the site will not result in significant flood hazards or flood damage and is in conformance with the applicable flood hazard protection requirements. Finding is yes, none of the proposed changes are in the flood zone. The application has agreed that no seasonal campsites where an RV or camping trailer would be left during the off season will be allowed in the flood zone. I. Adequate provision has been made for the disposal of wastewater or solid waste and for the prevention of ground or surface water contamination. A finding of yes. The applicant will inspect and clean the septic systems on a regular basis and provide copies of the inspection slash cleaning records to the code enforcement office. Inspection will be performed on a yearly basis at a minimum. J, adequate provision has been made to control erosion or sedimentation. Finding is yes. Erosion control measures are included as part of the site plans. K, adequate provision has been made to handle stormwater runoff or other drainage problems on the site. The finding is yes. Grading and drainage measures to handle stormwater runoff are included as part of the site plan. L, the proposed water supply will meet the demands of the proposed use or for fire protection purposes. Finding is yes. The proposed changes will not have a significant effect on the water supply. The proposed bathhouse includes only toilets and not showers. Reduction of the number of campsites to 300 may reduce the peak water demand somewhat. M, adequate provision has been made for the transportation, storage, and disposal of hazardous substances and materials as defined by the state law. Finding was that that was not applicable. N. The proposed use will not have an adverse effect, an adverse impact on significant scenic vistas or on significant wildlife habitat, nor will have such an impact that could be avoided, but 
nor will have such an impact that could be avoided by reasonable modification of the plan. Finding is yes, the proposed changes will not affect scenic vistas. Reduction of the number of campsites to 300 may reduce the existing effect of the campground on wildlife somewhat. Oh, the proposed use will not cause unreasonable highway or public road congestion. Finding is yes, the proposed changes in the entry area will reduce the possibility of vehicles awaiting registration backing up onto Mills Road. P, existing off-site ways and traffic facilities can handle safety, safely and conveniently accommodate the increased traffic generated by the development as far away from the development as the effects of the development can be traced with reasonable accuracy. Yes, the proposed changes will not increase traffic. Reduction of the number of campsites to 300 may reduce traffic somewhat. <clears throat> 17, when a proposed development will be located within the shoreland or resource protection zones, in addition with the requirements of the Kennebunkport Land Use Ordinance, Article 10, the town-wide regulations in Article 6, the performance standards for specific activities and land uses in Article 7, approval of the development will also require that the board makes positive findings based on the information presented that the proposed use, A, will maintain safe and healthy conditions, the finding was yes, B, will not result in water pollution, erosion, or sedimentation to surface waters, finding is yes. C, will adequately provide for the disposal of all wastewater. Finding is yes. The new bathhouse is tied into the exist to an existing septic system and not located in the shoreland or resource protection zones. D, will not have an adverse effect on spawning grounds, fish, aquatic life, bird or other wildlife habitat. Finding is yes. The proposed changes will not substantially affect wildlife habitat. To address a concern unrelated to the proposed changes that was raised during the public hearings, the applicant has agreed to prevent campers from launching kayaks by dragging them across the resource protection zone. E, will conserve shore cover and visual as well as actual points of access to inland and coastal waters. Finding was not applicable. None of the proposed changes are in the shoreland or resource protection zones. Will protect archeological and historic resources as designated in the comprehensive plan. Finding was not applicable. Will avoid problems associated with floodplain development and use. The finding was yes. None of the proposed changes are in the flood zone. The applicant has agreed that no seasonal campsites where an RV or camping trailer would be left during the off season will be allowed in the flood zone. And H is in conformance with the performance standards set forth in section 5.6 of the Kennebunkport land use ordinance. Finding is yes, erosion control measures, which is the gist of section 5.6, are included as part of the site plans submitted to the applicant, by the applicant. So we hit the conclusion section. That's like I'm here. <laughs> Ar good. Articles 1010A of the Land Use Ordinance mandates that the Planning Board shall approve a site plan application unless it makes one or more identified findings that would otherwise compel denial. And as noted above, the Board makes no such findings. Decision, the site plan application identified above is hereby approved. Conditions of approval, if any, pursuant to Article 10.11 and 10.12E. Pursuant to Article 10.11, the Planning Board attaches the following conditions to the approval of this application. And uh, we're going to go A through L here. A, Sandy Pines Campground shall continue to operate as a seasonal campground, open for business only between 15 April and 15 October. B, the number of campsites on the property shall not exceed 300. C, the number of, quote, seasonal sites where RVs and camping trailers may remain unoccupied outside of the operating season shall be limited to a maximum of 76, none of which shall be located in the flood zone. D, all site work on the property shall be performed under best management practices as described by these main Department of Environmental Protection documents. 
One, main erosion and sediment control best management practices manual for designers and engineers dated October 2016, as the same may be amended from time to time. Two, main erosion and sediment control practices field guide for contractors revised through 2014, as the same may be amended from time to time. Three, gravel road maintenance manual a guide to landowners on camp and other gravel roads dated April 2016, as the same may be amended from time to time. E, Sandy Pines LLC shall use only organic fertilizers and pesticides and shall not use any fertilizers in the shoreland or resource protection zone areas. F, Sandy Pines LLC shall use native plants in the landscaping to the extent practical. G, Sandy Pines LLC shall inspect all septic systems on an annual basis at a minimum. Sandy Pines LLC shall maintain and clean the septic systems on a regular basis and provide copies of the inspection cleaning records to the Code Enforcement Office. H, Sandy Pines LLC shall fund the Healthy Beaches water testing programs in Kennebunkport in the amount of at least $2,500 per year as long as that program exists. I, Sandy Pines LLC shall not provide a transportation service, service for the purpose of shuttling campers to Goose Rocks Beach. J, Sandy Pines LLC shall erect barriers and signage restricting kayak launching to the location provided by the campground for that purpose. K, Sandy Pines LLC shall erect signage in the entry area asking vehicles awaiting registration to turn off their engines in order to minimize noise, fumes, and odor. L, in order to minimize disturbance to abutters, Sandy Pines LLC shall allow no electronically amplified music, for example, bands, karaoke, disc jockeys, from hosted activities and events after 10 p.m. Item two, the applicant pursuant to 10.12.e shall notify the planning board prior to transfer of rights to construct an approved project. Three, the applicant must record a copy of this decision and provide proof of such recordation in the York County Registry of Deeds before any permits may be issued or before any construction activity may commence. And four, the applicant shall comply with all terms and conditions of the Town of Kennebunkport ordinances as well as the main DEP approvals, dated 18 April 2018. The end. <laughs> well done, Ed. Um, are there any comments or concerns from the board on the findings of fact? No. The applicant? Any? No. Okay. I have a couple of comments. Okay. Um, I strongly object to a sentence in there. I think it's, the findings are great. But on um, the findings of fact, on uh, uh, number eight, okay, where you describe basically about the evidence, uh, historic range of campsites and so forth, and the evidence that we took uh -huh. down. I don't know if people can hear me. Um, You've already indicated that you have an affidavit from Mr. Doe, but then you put in also in March 2018, Mr. Doe spoke to Michael Spang, family member of the property's former owner, who confirmed that no new campsites were added after 1985, and the reference to it. I think that puts way too much weight on that affidavit in there. You know, findings of facts can eventually be go up on appeal to courts or look back on historically. And I think putting the emphasis on an affidavit, which does use hearsay evidence, even though they've taken hearsay and anecdotal evidence throughout, uh, puts uh, too much evidence. It, it just puts too much uh, emphasis on there. And then the other thing about that is if you go back and read that affidavit, that's only one part of it from Michael Spang, he also indicated basically that they never turned anyone away and just fit them into overflowing uh, in the campground and you're ignoring that part of the affidavit by putting in that sentence. So I think um, 
it's really not appropriate to keep that sentence in there. I would strike it. The, the last sentence and the, the last two sentences, you're saying? No, just, just the last sentence where it starts in March 2018. And then leave C. Stephen Doe affidavit dated March 12th? No, take that out. Take, take both sentences out. I assume out. that was the reference in there, mm -hmm. yeah. Take both of those out. I think you okay. have enough in there and you already referenced the affidavit. I'll, I'll so you on. leave the reference to the affidavit in item 13 then? Yes, you can leave the reference to the affidavit in other parts and there's a reference to the affidavit in that part at the beginning already. Oh, yes. Yes, I believe so. Yes, there yes, is. Yes, and, and, yeah. and so you're you're really emphasizing okay. something that's real hearsay, mm -hmm. okay. and that you know we have other evidence too. You're giving it too much weight. Mm, sure. Um, and the only other thing I would suggest, which is not, you know, that important, is um, on 17D, will you say basically on the shoreland a resource protection zone? Will not have an adverse effect, effect impact. Sorry, I'm worse than you. <laughs> <laughs> On spawning grounds, fish, aquatic life, bird, or other wildlife habitat. I would add at the end, um, as a condition of approval, the applicant will not allow electronically amplified music after 10 p.m. I would add, add that simply because amplified music at night can affect wildflower owl and other wildlife okay. behaviors. So it's an additional reason it's just for doing that. It, it's an additional thing. reason so, for doing that. Yeah. And those are my only mm. two comments. That's it? I wouldn't object to that. No, okay. I have no problem with those changes. <clears throat> mm -hmm. We could line them out. Well, we, I, I, what's the mechanism? You want to come we, back, come we back could, in two weeks and do it then? Or? Well, we could line one out, but... You, you, could, you could line out that one and just add that in. People can initial it. It's fine. Okay. You comfortable doing that? Yeah. Sure. We just okay. get through it today. And, and not add the second one? Yeah. On 17. Because we, we do have that condition. Have condition like that. You have it in another place, but um, under that particular... Um, part where it says no in adverse in fact impact on spawning grounds, fish, bird, wildlife, and so forth. I will put that in as an additional reason for finding yes on that. No, I, I understand what you said. Okay. I'm, I'm looking for a way to finish this tonight. Yes, you, you can just write it in. I think right, so. Right, right. We have that condition, but this is supporting that statement that it will not have an adverse impact because <laughs> we have a condition which prohibits mm. the, the amplified, amplified music. music. Yeah. Um, do you have that written out? Ralph? What, what you'd like to, to see? To make it yep. simpler, could he just put under that section, uh, uh, Nina, um, uh, refer to condition L. Yes. Yes. So you yes. don't have to write the whole thing out again. Sure. Thank you. Yeah. Just refer to condition. Uh, that's, L. that's a good idea. <clears throat> and, yep. and you don't even know how bad my penmanship <laughs> is. So. <Yes. laughs> but this is the one that I would strike out the L. <coughs> and then refer to it. condition L. Okay. You got it. So while, um, so Ed, you'll while you work on that, um, I think we we seem to be at a point where. Um, We've had a lot of deliberation. We've gone through the findings of fact as a draft and then in this form with some amendments. Um, it seems like we're in a position where the board can vote on the project as a whole and then um, depending on the outcome of that vote, then vote for the approval of the findings of fact as amended um, in our just last discussion. Mm -hmm. Seem right? Okay. I'm going to hold off on making these changes. Then. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Agreed. I liked how the conditions were included in the explanations. Yeah, you did a wonderful job. Very nice. Yeah. We, we, we did a decent job on this, guys. You, you did all, all of right. us. Um, Including <coughs> everyone. Amy, not here. And Warner, thank you. Um, so I'll entertain a motion. Move we approve the uh, site plan. 
Am, am I allowed to second that? You can. Mm -hmm. You right. can. You may. All right. I second that. Okay. All okay. those in favor? Aye. Opposed? Abstain. He's abstaining because he was okay. several. So the um, application has been approved. Uh, now I'll make those changes. Now you can make yeah. those changes? All right. While um, Ed makes those changes, um, I'll introduce our last item and give folks a chance to set up. It's uh, case number 180201, Binnacle Hill, phase two. Terradine Consultants, authorized agent, preliminary subdivision review. It's a public hearing for approval of 13 lot cluster subdivision on <coughs> 24, apologize, 24.78. I'm going to guess that's acres. It stops short. Sorry. I saw that too. Yeah. Uh, Henchy Way, map 41, block 2, lot 8, and Goose Rock Shoreland and Resource Protection Zones. So this, um, we have this listed as a public hearing, and um, we certainly intend to do that this evening. By way of um, order, and because we had a, a site walk, what I'd like for the group to do, and because we've requested peer reviews and we've received those peer reviews, what I um, am suggesting is that we start with um, discussion around the site walk, and if there are any, we'll, we'll start with an introduction. We'll move into discussion around the site walk from the board and deliberation there, um, and introduce then into discussion and deliberation the um, peer reviews that we've received, both from Thailand and Acorn. Um, and then when we get to a point where we think that has been exhausted or satisfied, then open the public hearing um, to those who are here. Does that sound like a decent game plan? There's a lot here. Um, and it, it, you've been sitting here for a while, and it could be a little bit longer, but there's a lot of information that <coughs> both the applicant have submitted Attorneys representing members of the public have submitted, so I think it's it's fair to make sure that we flesh through all of that and discuss it, and um, and then open the floor to the public hearing. Seeing no objection here, then I'll open it up to the applicant. Hi, folks. Good evening. I'm Mike Tadema Wieland. I'm a civil engineer with Terradine Consultants. I'm here with Jeff Bowley, who is the applicant, and Ralph Austin, who is the applicant's attorney. Uh, I'll give a sort of a quick overview of the project. It hasn't changed um, very much since the last time uh, we were here. We were originally before you on January 17th for a sketch plan. Uh, came back on March 7th for a preliminary hearing, and uh, most recently had a site walk on April 7th. Uh, like I mentioned, the project remains uh, as it was last before you, which is a 13-lot cluster subdivision on approximately 25.7 acres in the Goose Rocks Zoning District. Uh, the layout was designed really to, to minimize impacts to wetlands and wildlife habitat that uh, exists mostly in the, uh, the eastern half of the parcel. Uh, so the 13 lots are, are sort of clustered down closer to New Biddeford Road. Access will come from uh, Binnacle Hill Phase 1, which is Binnacle Lane, which is constructed, which we walked out to um, a couple Saturdays ago, and will connect through to Henchy Way, which is a, a, a private road where, uh, where our site walk began. Uh, the major change since we were last here has to do with ownership of Henchy Way, and Ralph put together a, a letter uh, describing that. Uh, since we originally submitted the application materials, uh, Ralph went through 
some extensive research, it turned out, to determine who actually owned the, the first 100 linear feet of Henchy Way, which is that 20-foot wide um, right-of-way that was outlined in, in orange tape on our sidewalk. Ralph determined the owner, um, and Jeff subsequently uh, secured a purchase and sale agreement on that piece of of Henchy Way, so in, in that piece of land will now become part of the subdivision. So at this point, the, the subject parcel contains everything that it contained before, plus this strip, so the, the subject parcel now extends all the way out to, to King's Highway. That said, we've discussed uh, several times before um, that 20-foot wide section does not meet the standards for a private way, as outlined in the, the uh, Kennebunkport subdivision ordinance. So we are requesting a waiver from uh, the public road standards for that 100-foot length. Uh, again, we've talked about this before. The private way standards require a 50-foot right-of-way, 18 feet of pavement, paved travel lane, a uh, three-foot shoulder, and a three-foot sidewalk. We've only got 20 feet to do that in, which isn't enough, so we're proposing the 18 feet of pavement, which, uh, which does meet the standard, but asking for a waiver on the right-of-way width and the sidewalk. Uh, Ralph could give get into much more detail on the on the legalities of of that the the new uh, the new piece that is now become part of the subdivision, um, but unless there are uh, further questions, um, I think we'll close it at that. So I think we will talk or ask Ralph to discuss the ownership piece. Sure. Um, we also um, because there have been. Um, some correspondence from from various people around this piece we did ask um, Amy the town council to chime in um, we have not heard back from her yet um, just as full disclosure um, I do have one question on that 18 foot traveled way with which you have mm -hmm. but then it's 20 feet so um, without maybe the detailed Design. Can you explain how that road, if built, would stop a foot to either side, and what would be used there, whether it be curving or a slope into grass? Sure. So, so today, and here's a, here's a larger scale <coughs> plan on the road. It's like to see it as well. So today, as as we all saw on the site walk, um, we're talking about this area here. Uh, today there's 10 to 12 feet of width of, of gravel. Um, the Fetzner's house is here, uh, adjacent to that stretch, and then this, um, this, I guess, triangular piece of land, also owned by the Fetzner's, is on, is on the other side. Grass on both sides. Um, the proposal would be, as you said, 18 feet of pavement within there. Uh, and, and that additional foot would be uh, really gravel or a, a, an extension of those lawns, really. Um, today, uh, today there's no curbing, as you saw, so we're, we're really not proposing to change the condition, change the, the grades of the road, um, with the exception of just widening the travel way uh, to make it uh, better for, for two-way traffic and, and emergency vehicles. Wait, I have a quick question. <clears throat> um, the uh, Henchy Way that's beyond the 100 feet, <clears throat> um, it does have a 50-foot right-of-way. Does the center line of the proposed road pretty much follow the middle of the right of way? It does, yeah. So obviously we're constrained in that 20 foot 
width, but uh, the the road, the center line, and the right of way sort of swings away from the two abutting houses. Um, in the center line, does follow the the center of of the right of way. The right of way is shown sort of from this black line to this yellow line. The yellow line represents the the boundary of the overall parcel, um, and this black line represents the okay. edge of the proposed right of way of, okay. of Hedgey Way. It looks like on the first 100 feet, <clears throat> the uh, center line isn't quite in the middle of the right of way. Is it off by three feet by chance? Uh, because it, it says in the regs that it can be off by three feet either way. Yeah, it, it, it'll, because it's sort of some, the, the geometry is a little irregular there as you go from that 20 foot width to the 50 foot width, there is a transition there. Mm -hmm. um, whether it's three feet or, or some other number, I, I don't have that offhand, but if, if three feet is the, the, uh, the maximum it can deviate, then, then we'll, okay. we'll uh, confirm that that's the case. Um, I've, so the um, peer review um, on traffic in particular, well, both, the, the engineering report had a lot that I think we're going to need to go through, um, but also the traffic. Do you, do you want to address each in terms of your impression and what your take is or where you think changes should be made? And based on that conversation, then I think we can get into some specifics. Yeah, and we haven't had a chance to respond to the peer review comments yet. We sure. received them sort of too recently. Sure. Um, I guess I think the way I would characterize the engineering peer review comments was were very technical. Yeah. Um, a lot of a lot of small changes that'll be made to to notes or to radiuses that sort of thing. Mm -hmm. um, nothing I saw would would have a huge impact on the the overall design in general. Um, I'm happy to sort of answer questions about some of the, the any of the specific comments if there are the grinder pumps. The grinder pumps, yeah. sure. So, um, go, go back to the overall plan. Yeah. So the the way the sewer um, wastewater would be des is designed on this project. There's existing gravity sewer in Henshi Way. We saw the manhole uh, on our site walk up here. Yeah. The all wastewater flows will will get to that uh, gravity sewer from phase two. From phase two, these four lots up at the end of Henchy will flow by gravity. gravity. So there'll be a gravity pipe in the ground um, through that section of Timber Way and connect directly to to the existing manhole uh, in Henchy. The remaining nine lots will have individual grinder pumps mm -hmm. in the in each home uh, and will will pump out to a common force main uh, so a pressure sewer along this stretch of of timber and <clears throat> will will discharge outlet into that gravity gravity system so so these nine lots closer to phase one will be pressure sewer uh, and the four up at the top of Henchy will be gravity. And really that's, as you get farther and farther uh, this direction to the north, um, you're having to put the sewer deeper and deeper in order to, to get gravity flow to the existing system. And with the ledge out there, it, it just makes it kind of impractical to, to serve these lots um, with gravity sewer. And I'll say a similar phase one was designed in a similar way. Some of some of actually, I think every lot in in phase one has a, a grinder pump and a and a pressure, a force main. That as I say, if I'm not mistaken, it comes down to New Bitterford Road. Comes down to New Bitterford Road. Into exactly. it that way, yep. right? We've submitted a, an application uh, to the to the sewer department, and um, 
sort of responding to comments as sure. as they've come in. We'll have another time to ask other questions, I assume. Oh, certainly. I'd, I'd like to um, try to get a little more of a feeling about the um, ownership, ownership of the, I'm sure you did a lot of good research um, of the uh, private road. Mm -hmm. Just to, I mean, because you can't really pave something that you don't no. own and that yeah, kind of I thing. So I don't know why that didn't come up <clears throat> way back when. What was the, uh, what's Just there a, general feeling of how the research went. I, yeah, I um, looked at it, it was kind of complicated for me to Yes, it was, <laughs> very complicated, but I mean, uh, really what it essentially boils down to is that the, the Ritchies, JC and Cheryl Ritchie, uh, owned uh, a significant portion of property in this area, including the property that uh, uh, Jeff is proposing to develop that is owned right now by uh, Babak Gayor. Uh, they also owned the property that was conveyed uh, for Pinnacle Hill Phase 1. Um, historically, the Ritchies owned uh, all of what it would call Hinchy Way, right down to King's Highway. Uh, for whatever reason, and I have no clue because I didn't represent them, um, but when they sold the property to uh, Gayor, uh, it stopped, the, the piece conveyed to him stopped 100 feet short of King's Highway, and they retained ownership of that 100-foot strip. Um, and in doing the research in the registry, you'll see that um, over time, for example, uh, the Ritchies, I believe it was J.C.'s parents, gave an easement to the town for the sewer line going up Hinchy Way, which is, again, an uh, indication of, of that they owned it at right. that time. Um, they uh, painstakingly looked at every deed that was conveyed out. Um, uh, going back to, um, well, look here what it was, but back to 1941 uh, <clears throat> when Laura Hinchy acquired it, uh, forward to now, and that strip was never uh, conveyed out, so they are the owners. I thought I was going to read somewhere that the Fetzners had owned it at one point because they have land on either side of it, but I didn't see that. No, they, 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 when they, if you look at the Fetzner deed, um, they have a, a uh, 20 foot wide right. easement between right. those two parcels. They're two lots. Yeah, they never owned that. And, and, and I mean, there were several, if I could, there were, there were several reasons for wanting to acquire ownership of that piece. One was, and I'm not sure I heard someone reference it just a minute ago, but with an easement, there's always a question of how much can you improve the road within that easement area? And paving is always an issue if there's not uh, a specific right to right. pave the road. Right. <clears throat> Excuse me. And while we certainly could have gotten an improved easement deed that allowed that, uh, the other reason was, if you remember our last meeting on, on this, um, we got into a discussion of the private road standards in uh, uh, Section 6 of the uh, Land Use Ordinance versus, uh, and, and the Planning Board being able to modify those standards versus the Planning Board waiving the uh, road standards in the subdivision regs, which to us it seemed easier to work under the subdivision regs, um, which the Board is more familiar with, uh, which I think just sort of makes more sense, and so acquiring that piece allowed it to be part of the subdivision and therefore subject to the uh, waiver requirements of the uh, subdivision regulations. With, with that acquisition, what, what would it take to further widen that road, not on the side where the properties and their driveways are, but on the other side? Wh whose land is that, and what would it take to acquire? I can uh, answer the first. I can't answer the second. <laughs> um, the Fetzners own that. Um, I think um, Mike pointed out, if you go back to that, the triangular portion yes. um, between between Hinchy Lane. Between. The, the area that's marked Fetzner property that lies between Hinchy, Hinchy Lane and uh, King's Highway, that's their property. They own that. So the, there's 20 feet between the two Fetzner parcels. On both sides of Hinchy Way? Correct. Mm -hmm. 
an awful lot of the objections here um, that, that we see in the traffic and all and the, the thought of using this as a an entrance way to a to a development and all are are all stem off of the same fact that it's a it's a small road mm -hmm. not, not that King's Highway is a large road but 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 it is a small road and uh, I just wondered if there was any thought to uh, reaching out in that in that direction uh, I know that the attorneys for the Fetzners are here this evening um, and they I don't know if they're in a position to comment on that or not I mean Understood. we certainly wouldn't mind reaching out and, and um, uh, but I uh, it looks like it still squeezes it though a little bit towards the tail end I don't know Mike would have to comment on, on that yeah not to say it's it's, it's just if we're looking at a you know, if you were looking at this globally down from a satellite, not, not knowing who owned what and, and what agendas were, were in play, you certainly would, if you were going to put the, if you're going to put the road in, you would want it to be the same width road all the way out to, to King's Highway. And yeah, so some, I agree. Some Ideally, of the concerns with safety and uh, sure. yeah. Ideally, sidewalks. It, it would be... Uh, the same and and really the the proposed stretch of henshi within the 50 foot right of way so so this once you get on to the the subject parcel or, or well i guess both now that they're both part of the subject parcel now but once you get on to what was the the uh, <coughs> gayor property uh right. and the, the right of way does widen out to 50 feet <coughs> the proposed roadway section there is 18 feet of pavement, which again meets the, the private road standard, and it continues to be 18 feet all the way out to, to Kings Highway. Right. It what doesn't exist is the sidewalk and the, the shoulders. Right, right. And the reason it's it's out to 50 feet is is seems to be strictly because that's what the regulations require. If you Correct. think about bringing a sidewalk down there and then terminating it and get the traffic guy suggesting that you don't do that if I'm reading this correctly, it, it just seems like we're, we're blindly following a regulation and, and I wanted to know, if, has every effort been made to try to do it completely? Sure, and, and I assure you that in a cooperative the applicant would manner. be happy to, to be in discussions about putting a, putting a sidewalk through this area, but, but currently has no... Well, I don't know what concessions would have to be made. It probably wouldn't be all financial, but, but there might be. Yeah, and, and if, I, if I can talk about this connection a little more, you know, we, we've... So the design of, of phase one here, which terminates in a cul-de-sac and, and received a, a waiver for... Um, maximum dead end road length, which is yeah. 800 feet in, per ordinance. And I think this is, this is about 1,000 a, a feet or, or maybe even more. 1,000 no, feet. Uh, that sounds right. More than 800. So a waiver was granted for that. And, and really there was... When you look at the, that parcel, the shape and orientation and location of that parcel, there, there's no other, there's no alternative. Uh, with, uh, you know, ideally a, a second, second means of getting in and out um, is, a, is a better design, uh, primarily for emergency access. Uh, you know, you've got these these lots that are, are farther from New Bitterford Road, you know, in this case, the lots that, that are out towards the cul-de-sac, and in this design, you know, if, if this were to, to go away, if this connection here were to go away, these lots that are, are farther from New Bitterford Road, um, of course, take, take longer to get to uh, in case of an emergency. And in particular, if there's some situation where one of these roads becomes blocked. Uh, a, you know, a second, a second way out or in um, becomes quite important. So, 
So, so you're, you're, you're emphasizing the safety of the people that purchase those lots. Correct. Here, under a, a circumstance where I, I know I read the, the felled tree uh, scenario. And I, and I smiled at that because I, <laughs> I live on a, on a cul-de-sac. In fact, it, it actually does have one outlet. It outlets to another cul-de-sac. So it's, it's a pretty long stretch. And we just had a tree go down and uh, had to go out with a chainsaw and take care of it. And I found myself smiling, reading the thought that this was a, a really compelling case because th that's an argument against ever buying on any cul-de-sac. I don't care how long it is. Don't, don't ever do that. It, it's not compelling. It wasn't, it wasn't to me. It's, it's a consideration for sure. But I think you need to weigh it against the safety uh, of the current abutters on, on Henshi Way. Uh, so, and, and, I, and, and at the emergence of that road on, onto King's Highway. Absolutely. And, and the chairman asked for my general comments on the, the traffic peer review, and I, I can give those as well. You know, it, when I read the peer review, I read essentially the peer reviewer agreed with, with all the, the traffic generation numbers of the, uh, of the, the traffic impact analysis that was prepared on behalf of the project uh, and also concurred that uh, there are no high crash locations as reported by DEP um, and the volume of traffic is not going to cause uh, any capacity issues or safety issues in the area. So, you know, we're talking about 13 trips during, during the busiest hour of the day. We're talking about 13 trips in the total subdivision, some of which would be going out this direction, out Timber Way, some of which would be coming out through Henshi Way. So I think the, you know, the issue of number of trips causing a safety concern is, is a, a bit overblown. Uh, it's a minuscule number of trips. Um, we're talking about, a, in, again, in the peak hour of the day, we're talking about a trip every four to six minutes, you know what I mean? So, uh, again, traffic volume is, is not a safety concern in this issue. I mean, today we have a, you've got two houses that access this, and it's a 10-foot wide gravel road, and they have two-way access, right? It's a driveway, <laughs> you know, really, for them. Right. So, uh, we think that improving it, widening it to, to 18 feet to allow, um, to allow two means of in and out as well as emergency access is, is the responsible thing to do here. If I could just respond briefly to, to add comment. Um, uh, I don't think I meant, or I certainly didn't mean my comment in the letter to say that that was a the only reason or the most compelling reason, but when I think the board as planners have an opportunity to allow for a secondary access, particularly for emergency vehicles, it, it just makes good sense. Um, and as Mike points out, when we're taking, we propose to take uh, a really substandard road, as you said, essentially a driveway, and, and, and make it better, um, we feel that uh, is a consideration for the board. Seems like no one could possibly be objecting to that. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah. if, if we could go back to Henchy Way, I have a couple of concerns there. Henchy Way is proposed to be a, a collector, right, under the land use ordinance. It goes out into a public way. Um, Ed brought up the subject that the ownership of one side of that, is it 100 feet along there? Yeah, yeah it's 100, about 100 foot. Length. Yeah. It is owned by one party. Does the Kenny Bunkport Conservation Trust own any part of it too? So the Kenny Bunkport Conservation Trust owns this piece of land here. Okay, but not the part that you're developing. 
Correct. Yeah, okay. that, that's under separate ownership. Okay. Yeah. All right. So, you know, it, it's a strange intersection there to begin with. It's a triangle, and, um, you know, you've got people coming from one end to King's Highway, and they'd have people coming down Henshi. And you're, even if you put a sidewalk down there, I mean, it ends in the middle of a triangle where you've got traffic coming from both directions. And it doesn't make much sense to have a sidewalk come out there. Um, I'm not so concerned with the traffic impact of vehicles. I'm concerned with the pedestrian traffic because this is not a normal subdivision just placed, you know, in you know, in a city or something like that. This is in a beach area where people walk to the beach and you know people are gonna come from that subdivision and walk to the beach and you know they're gonna load up their strollers or whatever it is with beach chairs and stuff and be walking along and come back from the beach that way. And so my concern there is safety of the pedestrians that go in and out. Uh, Given the constraints of that section, one, I'd want to see a lot of lighting go up there so that at night, at dusk, when people might be walking back, you know, at low light levels, that they can be seen. I, I know the area is very open, but um, still, you'd want a lot of lighting in there. But the other thing I might suggest proposing, and I don't know whether this is feasible or not, is making Henchy Way a vehicular access for emergencies only, which would give you an outlet. In other words, have it gated, you know, up where your property starts. Have it paved, have it ready to go, but in case a fire truck needs to get through there, it can get through, but not allow your normal subdivision traffic to go through there. Have you mm. even thought about something like that? I don't think we allow gates. Uh, uh, just a quick question, um, I guess, Warner. Um, are gates allowed? I'm not sure. I haven't read the, that part of the subdivision regs to know if there's a concern with that or... Yeah, I mean, the, uh, the subdivision regs do discuss specifically uh, gated uh, entrances. Uh, I would say that within the context of the subdivision regs, it's more of uh, the intent of that is really to address uh, primary entrance gates. Uh, so, you know, what would give the appearance of gated of a gated community is what that prohibition is. Yeah, but I'm um, not. I'm not I don't talking know that it in refers terms of to like a fire access gate. So I'm it'd not be like talking a crash in terms gate. of privacy. That's right, a crash, a crash gate. gate. Yeah. Okay. Um, we would have to discuss that with with Jeff. Um, and would that require any changes to Timber Lane, Hinchy Way intersection? It, uh, it may, yes, probably not drastic changes, um, but it may, you know, you'd, you'd have a, you'd have essentially a turnaround situation there. Just something so that if a tree were brought blocking the main entrance, people then could open that gate, you know, easily open that gate and go out or in and use it as needed. It would also seem to get rid of uh, a lot of potential parkers that would decide to, in the Senshi Way and uh, Timber Way, great places to park, especially where it's private road and the town won't enforce the parking. You're saying it would it would no longer be as desirable a pa as a pass through, right? Yeah. Yeah, certainly with with any of the designs we're talking mm. about tonight, signage would be a part of that. No parking, and, and I understand uh, the town doesn't have uh, authority to police that if it's a private road, but. Signage for, for no parking as well as private way, residents only type signage would be would be part of the, the design to, to prevent that, to prevent uh, 
you know, people coming in and parking along the side there, um, as well as people cutting through, which I, when I look at it, I, I don't see it as a, a desirable cut through, but, um, but given its kind of uniqueness with, in its uh, proximity to the beach, maybe under some circumstances, uh, it, it could be, but. Well, if you had a sign that said emergency access only, no parking, you yeah. know, that tends to have some weight. Right. I guess while we're brainstorming on just different things to consider, um, and this isn't an expression of approval or disapproval, but we talked a little bit about the Fetzner property across the street, and... Um, if you know if this was to continue through and to Nina's point that intersection down there if that if that walkway were to continue you're going to dump people in the middle of a of a Y um, I wonder if there's the possibility of a swap of some sort where that might hook down to Kings Highway um, you know sort of in a left hand turn if you will with the proper width for a, a sidewalk and what we see today as being the private way could be a private driveway to that one property. Again, it, just I, in throwing different alternatives out there for potential consideration. If you had carte blanche. I'm not saying it's something you'd have to do, but. Um, and I guess I'd then the width where the property previously terminated, still, yeah. I would, you know, you might have to take a look at that in terms of with and if there was an exception granted there. But yeah, also, I'd probably have to end up talking to the conservation trust. Yeah, so. potentially, yeah. Um, which I would refer. There's from. also the 75 degree issue on the road intersection. Yeah, and just wondering if there are any thinking. solutions in there with sure. swaps, what have you, sure. that could please a few people and and be low cost maybe and. Um, and provide for a, an alternative solution. Yeah, I, I think all those, I, I would agree with you, and I think Jeff would too, um, all of them would require some sort of yeah. agreement or swap or something. Yeah. And, and mm -hmm. I think we'll, hearing what we're hearing tonight, I think we will explore that a little yeah. more thoroughly. <coughs> Sorry. <clears throat> Russ, could could we um, t talk for a minute about the about process here? Um, mm -hmm. so, so we got two two uh, peer reviews. Well, yeah. two, a two part peer, sure. peer review here, and I, I was struck by just the quantity of them and and. Is the, I don't know, there may be a tradition for how these are handled, but it struck me that what I'd want to do, in, in the absence of any other guidance, is I'd want to hear back on these 38 items, yeah. in, including, you know, each one of them, including their parts. Mm -hmm. And I'd like to think that ACORN would then sign off on it. In other words, they, they've done an engineering review. Mm -hmm. is, is it possible to have them weigh in on the response so that we... Anyway, I think that's typical. Quite yeah, that's what we would expect. So. Yeah, yeah. I mean, we've done that in the past. Yeah. Yeah. And then Usually I, I, the I feel like I didn't have to keep up on learning what a you know each each one of these what a, what a force main call out is. Yeah. And uh, yeah. although someone helpfully well, just, just explained that to me, but what yeah. we've had in the past, and it, I think it's really dependent on the situation and what you're seeing. Uh, we're you know, in situations where you're just dealing with some of your typical notes or, you know, maybe some, oh, yeah. some general calculations in the stormwater. Uh, in some cases, we've had it just addressed in the final plan uh, where it's a, you know, where it's a technicality. Uh, I think some of these items uh, that you see in, uh, in the peer review and the staff review, too, may deal with some design issues. And yes. so you may want to see those items addressed before you get out of and, preliminary. And, and, you know, a number of them that might go away, if you will, as, as, oh, yes, this is because you didn't see this additional piece of information, and other ones will be, hey, that's a great idea. But it would be nice if that could be done engineer to engineer and, and with, with some uh, a lot, transparency. A lot of what happens, at, uh, on, as 
Werner just said it on the second one. Right. There will be a condition that comes out in the letter which approves the, the which approves the preliminary plan that says you you know, every yeah. single not you know mm -hmm. issue from that so those uh, peer review will be uh, addressed in the final. And uh, yeah. we have we certainly on the Mills Road we sent the final back to the peer review company for a final you know, to make mm -hmm. sure that everything was touched. And ask them to essentially check that all of their concerns mm -hmm. Yeah, and then yeah. and generate any new ones they might have. But yeah. yes. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah, and we, we, we will work with We'll work with them. We'll reach out to them and and address them all. I think exactly as you're yeah. you're yeah. suggesting. Thank you. Yeah. So as a matter of procedure, this is if there's still the preliminary review that's going on. We have right. a public hearing as well. Yep. Um, and other things being offered and discussed tonight for consideration. So there's a lot going on. Um, but as we you know as we get together in additional meetings we'll see eventually peer reviews diminish mm -hmm. or be addressed and right. I would expect or so. contested or what have you. The, the board won't have to keep a detailed Excel spreadsheet of so these 38 job, items, Ed. but well, no, that's what I was worried about. <laughs> yeah, I know it is. <laughs> we've, we've, we've both been there, Tom, I know in <laughs> past lives, but, 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 but having seen this and, and, and it's written clearly enough that it, yep. so yeah, that is, that is a good point. You'd like to be able to trace it to conclusion in the end game. Thanks. That said, Ed, there's really no better time than the present to discuss some of these, or if you do have questions that you think are substantial um, that could be addressed, you're welcome to raise them now. Well, so somebody already raised the, the 75 degree one, and I'd, I'd, I'd love to hear a, a comment on. Oh. on uh, what, what the thinking is with regard to the, the, public the skewed intersection. Sure. The, uh, yeah, so I'm sorry. I didn't, I, I think you're, you're referring to the, the comment on the 75 degree uh, intersection of timber. I'll, I'll, and I'll read it. Confirm that the Henchy Way and Kings Highway intersection is no less than 75 degrees per the street design guideline set for private ways. Yeah, well, yeah, I mean, we're working with an existing private way I I don't know off the top of my head what that is but um, with an existing condition like that certainly if we were designing it from from new uh, we would meet the regulation but um, we, with with the current condition where this yeah we, we will confirm that again we haven't had a, a a chance to to go through those in detail. Yet, I'm not surprised at, at your at your reaction. It's like, well, what are you going to do about it? But it's a good, it's a damn good question. Mm -hmm. Now that you're going to put additional traffic on it and make it into a a more important road, that's not the right word, but a uh, than it is today. Mm -hmm. I, I I don't know why the 75 degrees is what it is, but I assume it has to do with sight lines and safety. Yeah, and, you know, just turning movements as well, you know, more than a 90-degree turn is... Oh, all right, so the moving van might have trouble. You're right with it, but yeah. I, was I, mean, more, the, I was more concerned about the safety aspects of it. Thank you. All right. Um, you know, Mark had mentioned while we were chatting that we do have a public hearing tonight. Um, yeah. It sounds like there's still quite a bit to occur here, but this, you know, that said, it, you know, we did this in an effort to try to do our best not to hold up process. Um, um, I, I did you have comments about the site walk you had mentioned? Yeah, I mean, we opened it up to the board for any discussions okay. or deliberation on the site walk. Um, I don't think I heard any, but it's not to say we can't we can't discuss that now. Okay. I but, thought you had something, but um, so I guess I'm inclined. We there's still quite a bit of work to do here. Um, I know we um, if we open public hearing, the likelihood is that it'll probably continue because there's going to be a lot of new information coming. Mm -hmm. um, 
but I think that given the number of people that I see sitting here and it's 9 o'clock, mm -hmm. I uh, might make sense to maybe proceed to opening the public hearing, receiving some comment and thought. I know there have been some discussions of suggestions of, hey, what if you talk to so-and-so? Um, it's not to say that needs to happen here. No, you know, no negotiations on the floor. Um, but <laughs> if the board doesn't object, I'd like to open it. May um, I say... Can I make a comment yeah. first? Certainly. Okay. Yeah. Uh, good evening. Uh, my name is Jeff Bowley, uh, the applicant. Um, so I just a, a guess a, a couple of things. Um, uh, as it relates, I, you know, I don't want to speak to any specific item, but um, I think it's, it's important for you to understand <clears throat> um, from me, you know, no offense for, uh, to Ralph, um, but from me that, you know, the, the thought process here from day one has always been um, a knowledge that this um, application uh, could potentially uh, impact the Fetzners and the Millers. They're the two abutters, um, in addition to the other uh, abutters in the, in the neighborhood uh, at large. So there's been considerable thought that's been put into that, and that thought has been um, um, uh, top of mind from day one. Uh, that's why we've met with um, um, Bill and Bill's family and, um, and their counsel uh, met with Roger and Lisa, um, had correspondence with both of them, sat down with them. Um, uh, prior to, um, and I have to think about the dates, but prior to a preliminary application and in some cases correspondence after. So um, it's, it's, it's not as though um, uh, the application has been made without any um, you know, concern to their thoughts. Um, um, Nita, you made comments to safety. Um, it is important for you to know I'm going to live here. Um, and uh, my family is going to be walking down this road, too. So uh, safety is, um, is certainly a, a big concern. I am more than um, interested in having a conversation. If the, if the Fetzners uh, would be amicable to it, to um, uh, uh, swap, uh, uh, however it would work out to, to um, ease the burden on, on this 100-foot you know, path, certainly, I'm certainly open to that. Um, if nothing more than uh, to, to do the, site, uh, the sidewalk that you're proposing. Um, speaking to the, to the application in general, um, there is language in the comprehensive plan, there's language in the blue binders that are all in front of Warner over there um, about connectivity um, and the importance of connectivity um, for, uh, mostly for safety. Um, and uh, that language was something that we considered highly um, when we initially uh, looked at how to um, best design the parcel. Um, two elements, really. Safety and the environment. Um, those are the ones that um, really come to the forefront always, and those are the ones that we looked at um, uh, really right out of the gate. Um, so thanks for your time. If I could just make one more request to the board. This is obviously a crucial piece of the design, um, th this waiver request that we've, we've talked about tonight. Uh, we've, we've been, this process has gone on now for, for several months, um, and we're hoping tonight the board can give uh, some direction on on, on whether or not the waiver uh, is possible or not, because, um, like I said, if if not, it's going to necessitate a, a redesign, and and we want to begin that process to explore whether or not uh, development of this kind is even feasible. Um, and if it is, then we w would like to to continue down the path of making it the best design that we can, the safest design that we can, but. Um, but we are asking that the board at least give some guidance tonight um, on that. Thank you. <coughs> Apologies. Um, so why don't we open the public hearing? Um, 
and I'll ask if there are any abutters here tonight that wish to speak or representatives of abutters. Maybe if we could just have um, speak just to that specific issue. Um, you can speak to many of them now that the floor is yours. <laughs> Good evening, members of the board. Uh, my name is Ben McCall, along with my uh, colleague Scott Edmonds. We're attorneys at Bergen and Parkinson, and we do represent the Fetzners, as you have probably uh, surmised from uh, the number of letters that we've submitted to the board over, over this process. Um, our, our clients certainly have comments that I think they're best positioned to give uh, about the potential impacts of the use of Henshi Way on their property um, and on their families, but uh, it, it seems opportune for me to speak directly to the issue of the waiver, uh, which we addressed in uh, a letter that we sent to the board on, on March 30th. Uh, it's, it's good uh, that the board has asked the town attorney to opine on this issue. I think that will certainly give guidance and, and uh, we trust will, will largely corroborate what uh, we've said in our letter. But uh, the, crux, the crux of the issue um, is this. As we know, uh, a 50-foot... Um, right-of-way is required uh, both in the subdivision regulations in uh, section 12.2 for a private road uh, but also in section 6.14 of the town's land use ordinance uh, for the use of a private road that's going to service four or more homes uh, and the main law court has been very clear on this issue uh, in a number of cases uh, starting in 1998 with a, a case called Perkins versus the town of Agunquit and dating uh, to 2004, uh, and they've said a very clear thing, and that is uh, that if the planning board wants to waive a subdivision regulation uh, where an identical uh, requirement also exists in the town's land use ordinance, uh, and, and we would say that that is exactly the case here, uh, where you require a 50-foot right-of-way for private roads in both these circumstances, if that is the case, uh, then the planning board, in fact, does not have the authority under Maine law to grant that waiver um, because that is, in effect, a variance. Uh, you're granting um, a reduction in road right-of-way standards uh, that would apply if this were outside of the normal subdivision regulations. And as we know, a variance can only be granted by the Board of Appeals. And so we, we think this issue is, is rather clear uh, certainly, if the applicant wishes to use Henshi Way uh, in the way that they've proposed, uh, we would certainly prefer uh, that it not be utilized in that way for an, a whole host of reasons. Uh, but if that's the plan that they wish to go forward with, um, then before this board can grant uh, a subdivision approval that uses Henshi Way in that way, um, that the applicant has to go to the Board of Appeals and receive a variance to reduce um, the right-of-way width. Um, I'm certainly happy to answer any questions that the board has on that. I, I obviously know that the, the town attorney will be opining on that too, but uh, appreciate the opportunity. Yes? I think the town attorney will probably weigh in on this, um, but, you know, in my readings of York, um, town of Agunquit and so forth, I don't think it's so clear cut because Kenny Bunkport has a very different type of zoning board of appeals. Um, in normal circumstances in most towns in Maine, uh, you appeal from the planning board directly to the zoning board of appeals. This is not so in Kenny Bunkport. In Kenny Bunkport, you go straight to the courts. Um, the other thing is that specifically in the land use ordinance, both in the regular land use ordinance and the subdivision regulations, there are provisions for the planning board to reduce or modify and vary and put out variances on some of these provisions. And if you look at section nine in the land use ordinance, you also find it appears that the zoning board of appeals is very restricted in what they can look at and uh, situations like this don't seem to be under their jurisdiction. So I'd wait for the town attorney before I'd make any decision on that. Uh, and, and absolutely, and I certainly am not asking the board to rush to any judgment on that. The, the one thing I would say, and I think attorney Austin uh, noted this in his response, um, there are certainly provisions in both the subdivision, <coughs> excuse me, 
the subdivision regulations and the land use ordinance that uh, give, um, but, you know, in that ordinance lay out powers uh, to either the Zoning Board of Appeals or to the Planning Board. Um, it's certainly a different matter, though, as to whether that authority can actually be granted legally under state law. And so uh, certainly, you know, for us it's a rather clear-cut issue. It, it's a variance um, if you need to reduce uh, right-of-way standards. And, and certainly an, an appeal um, of a decision would go directly to court. Um, but our argument is, is not necessarily about an appeal. It's that um, the use of Henshi Way uh, if it cannot be improved to a 50-foot right-of-way, uh, necessitates a variance before, um, or as part of that process, before the final approval can go through. There have been applicants in town that have gone to the zoning board first and then gone to the planning board with that extra information in their application. Um, but I do agree that zoning board addresses lot size, lot coverage. I've never seen them address right-of-way width. No, it's very specific right. in the in the regs what they can right. do, and the the type of appeal you're talking about usually comes from where they're going to the code right, enforcement exactly. officer for a permit, right, and not to the planning board. Right. So whether you know there this there may be some uh, case law on that, but that doesn't mean that the state has authority there to say this is what you're going to do no matter what you've written in your land use ordinance. There, you know, they were looking at the land use ordinance of Agunquit at that point, and our land use ordinance and zoning board uh, regulations mm -hmm. are different. So, you know, let's let's wait for the town attorney to weigh in on that. I, I that's certainly true. I, I would only add, I suppose, that the identical rule has been used in Cape with a case in Cape Elizabeth. Um, I. I I would certainly agree um, that it, it is not necessarily a 100% clear-cut issue, um, and, and we're happy to wait for the town attorney to, to opine on that and then uh, certainly provide our take on, on that opinion also. Um, but we just want the board to certainly be aware of, of that piece in the puzzle. Obviously, a, a large amount of, of the issues um, you know, raised regarding the subdivision do involve Henshi Way, and so we... We certainly appreciate the board's careful consideration of those issues. Oh, we're aware of jurisdiction <laughs> issues. <laughs> yeah, just on another note, too, you know, when the private road, uh, when those revisions were authored, you know, this was, I want to say this was probably in the 2006 era. Uh, it was done primarily because it was recognized that Kenny Bunkport didn't have any type of uh, private road standard that addressed. Uh, you know, development on private roads that didn't go through a, uh, a subdivision uh, review process. And so I can tell you when it was authored, it was intended specifically to address uh, private roads that don't go through a subdivision review process because subdivision exists, subdivision review and subdivision regs exist for these types of situations. Um, the ordinance also, you know, that section of the ordinance also specifically states that it's to be used uh, in the course of a site plan review. Uh, so it specifically identifies uh, to the board when you use that, uh, that particular piece of the ordinance. So, mm -hmm. I mean, I'm not familiar with, you know, Agunquits or Cape Elizabeths, uh, you know, but I think, uh, you know, the language identifies when it's to be used uh, and it's in the course of a site plan review. Other abutters or representatives of abutters or members of the public? We'll open it right up. Mm -hmm. um, hi, my name's Bill Fetzner, and um, I've been told to keep this down to three minutes, so I'll, I'll do my best. <laughs> You've got plenty of time. Uh, but. Um, <laughs> So my family owns the house that uh, we've been talking about uh, with the property on both sides. And um, it, as you know, our, our objections are about Henshi Way uh, being a secondary entrance into uh, Binnacle Hill too. And um, in, in that regard, I, I kind of want to address the, the traffic study because uh, a lot 
was based on the traffic flow going the opposite direction. And um, uh, my family has is, is owned that property for over 40 years, and uh, we've been coming to Goose Rocks for over 40 years. So I, I think we have a lot of uh, summer experience on what, what it's like at Goose Rocks in the summer, and I, I'm sure everyone here does as well. Uh, but I think in the summer, and, and we're talking from June to, you know, end of September, maybe halfway into October, so uh, four to five months, uh, most of these, these properties in uh, Pinnacle Hill, too, are going to be vacation, families vacationing, uh, either the owners or they're going to be renting it out. Uh, you know, there will be a mix of um, year-round residents, but uh, I think your typical day in uh, July or August is going to be what vacationers do at Goose Rocks, which is they're going to be going to the beach. And it's not going to make sense, you know, these, these houses here, it's not going to make sense when they want to go to the beach to go towards Benicol Way and then Biddeford Road and, and come down this way. They're going to take the most convenient, obvious pathway. And if Henchy Way is a, a road as the developer has proposed, it, it's going to be the most direct, convenient route for them to come to the beach. So they're going to get up in the morning. Uh, they're going to go to the beach. They're either going to load up a bunch of wagons and they're going to be pedestrians or I, I would argue a lot of them are going to be in their cars because it's going to be easier to take all their kids and family down and, you know, beach chairs, coolers, everything else. And um, they're going to take the direct, uh, most convenient way uh, down Hinchy Way and to the stop sign. Hopefully they're not going to blow through the stop sign and uh, go down Jeffrey's Way and, and drop everything off and uh, turn around where there, there's already a lot of congestion and it's already a very dangerous situation there. And, uh, you know, they'll drop everything off and then the car, they're not going to be able to park anywhere because there's never any parking. And they're going to, you know, one guy will come back and park the car. And then at the end of the day, uh, when the people are done with the beach, the, the car is going to go back down and get them. So uh, those, those are going to be multiple trips to the beach in cars or pedestrians. Uh, I would argue if they want to go to the tides, if they want to drop their kids off at the uh, summer camp at the community center, if they want to go to the general store, they would probably take Henshi Way again. They're not, they're not going to go backwards and then come down um, uh, New Biddeford Road. They're, they're going to take the most uh, direct uh, route to go where they want to go. And even uh, Benicill Hill 1. It, it might be more convenient for them to come this way as well. I mean, what's what's going to stop them uh, if if there is a route for them to take? That that would be a good way for them to go as well. So um, you're going to have a huge safety risk here as they go through this hundred foot stretch through our property. Uh, if you have you know cars coming both ways and you have pedestrians. What are they going to do? Are they going to just jump off the road onto our property? Because if they do, they're trespassing. Um, it, the cumulative effect of people going onto our property is going to take a toll. Uh, the safety hazard, I mean, it's not going to be a matter of if, it's going to be a matter of when, you know, how soon you're going to have a tragic accident right here uh, and the stretch. Because cars will go fast no matter what they're saying. I mean, they, they go fast right now sometimes on this dirt road. They will go fast. There will be people trapped in this stretch. There's going to be nowhere for them to go. And um, it's, it's just a very bad planning safety issue. So I urge the planning board to compel the developer to consider other options because there are other options. This is not the only way to go here. There's other options for them, and we haven't seen them yet. But um, Nina talked about one tonight, which seemed interesting, where you had a gate and it was just emergency access. I mean, there's all kinds of other options. So why, why do we want to rush to this unsafe situation? Why can't we consider the other options, which would be much safer for the public? So, so, may I ask you just a clarifying question? Is your feeling that the that the safety issue is due to the narrowness of the road or 
just the existence of the road. Would, would you have Do the same concerns if it was a 50 foot right of way? Um, I think the traffic is going to be way more than what's presented. Uh, the pedestrians are going to be caught in there. Um, there's nowhere for them to go right now. I mean, it, it can't be a 50 foot right away because it doesn't exist. It's only 20 feet through that 100 foot stretch. Um, so the, there, there is no, there's no way through there. Uh, the the public. Is you're you're saying it is it is because of the narrowness of it that that's your primary focus. That's concern. the primary. Yeah, I mean, and I assume that's why the ordinance is the way it is. is well, that's, that's why I asked earlier about wh whether the applicant had pursued discussions with the landowners on the opposite side of Henchy Way. Turns out you're one of them uh, to to acquire uh, sufficient lands either from yourself or through Kennebunkport land trust to to do something that was more optimum as if you were starting from scratch and, and that's that's why I'm pressing you on whether your concern is you, you don't want it there no way no how or does you, you really feel it's legitimate and, and you're making a good point about safety because of the narrowness of it and nowhere to go yeah it's the safety the narrowness there's nowhere to go and okay. we think they have other options they don't have to be. They don't have to do this. They want to do this, but they don't have to. Is your lot a conforming lot? Is it an acre in size? I think it's larger than an acre. Okay. Which one? Oh, oh, those are separate lots They're on either separate side. Lots. Okay. The little triangles. Okay. It's like they don't enter. <laughs> yes. <laughs> yeah, I was just wondering. Wrong. There's no option if if right. if it were one lot and it made it non-conforming, conforming mm -hmm. to non-conforming. There's no option there. But apparently, there is. I'll go out on a limb and say that the triangular piece is less than. Oh, yes. <laughs> 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 All right. I would agree. Would you be uncomfortable <clears throat> if, for example, that was an emergency access for vehicular traffic only, and there were a parking area up near the four houses there near Henchy so that people could walk down to the beach. They would still have to travel in their vehicles to go to the store or something like that. They'd have to go around. But if, it, if there weren't vehicles going through there, if there were a parking area where people from Binnacle Hill wanted to go to the beach, they could park their cars and walk to the beach. Where would they park? Uh, somewhere up near where those four lots are. It, it's not a long distance to walk. And, and so you would have a gate up here? Um, actually, I'd put the gate further down, but uh, have a parking lot so people could walk Henchy Way. Then you could have, at the end of Henchy Way, you could have them walking on the paved area and they could go to the other side of the street rather than hit the triangle. Um, we would, I mean, it, it's kind I mean, of hard to it, visualize. They don't have another access in there, and I'm the one who thinks of worst case scenarios for safety. I mean, like, yeah, a tree falls across the road during a forest fire, and you don't have time to get out your chainsaw, you know? <laughs> I mean, we, we would prefer a gate up here mm -hmm. so no vehicles could come could down, come down here. It, it would just be a gate, and emergency vehicles could go there if they needed to, or, you know, if they had to get out for some reason, they could open the gate. Okay. I mean, we would be open to that, you know, okay. there'd be a lot of kind of details to, to know about that, but okay. yeah, I mean, we would well, be open. Well, it, it depends on what 
how the developer feels about it. They have to look at those yeah. alternatives. I so. mean, I, I think I suggested that at one time when we met. So, so you had mentioned. Um, so that's one option. You had mentioned that that other options exist, but uh, besides that, what else might you suggest? Well, you know what they what they've done with Benicol Hill One. I mean, they could have a turnaround somewhere in here, and um, a, like a, a, another cul de sac. They'd be you know asking for a variance for for a cul de sac and maybe being beyond the eight hundred foot length uh, for mm -hmm. for a road with long driveways again yeah right. I just I was curious I mean we've I think the board's thrown out some suggestions or thoughts and you had mentioned that there were several and I didn't hear any so I was just curious to hear what they might be in case we haven't <coughs> thought about it I, I could I could come up with some more <laughs> um, more do you have more to share with us tonight um, I mean that's that's all I have right now if, if anyone has questions feel free to contact me anytime okay thank you thank you thank you with exhibits you did but I promise not to be here all night <laughs> yeah nothing's nothing staying here so uh, I mean I did want to say that Roger my husband and I are not in favor of a parking lot because that would be right adjacent to our house Make, I'll okay. explain a few things about that um, you also mentioned earlier lighting and I did not address that tonight my name is Lisa Miller <sighs> I was going to do my formal introduction in a second. Thank you. Uh, Just want to be sure. to the microphone. Before you get going. Someone can hear. All right. Thank you. No problem. So my name is Lisa Miller, uh, and my husband Roger and I uh, have own property at Four Hinchy Way that directly abuts the land that's proposed to develop as Phase Two of Binnacle Hill. And before I get into my prepared remarks, I just want to address a couple points that were uh, raised. Uh, we did not intend to bring up site lighting tonight because it's relatively minor concern uh, relative to our other more major concerns. Uh, but we do have a view easement over the property uh, across from us that prevents any structures other than a single-story home, which cannot be accommodated based on the fact that there's not enough land. So that does not allow the developer to put any light poles in a long Henshi way that would restrict our uh, light easement. There may be other alternatives at ground level that would comply, but light poles would not comply. Same with a large sign advertising Pinnacle Hill, which I'm sure would be great for marketing purposes. If you could have people driving along Hing Kings Highway closer to the water with the views to see that they had lots for sale up in Pinnacle Hill. Um, so that's going to be an issue later, but we'll save that for another day. So um, tonight I would like to address uh, the two primary concerns that my husband and I have with the project, uh, both with its current design and with the documentation provided as part of the developer's application. Our two primary, primary concerns can be summed up neatly, trees and traffic. First, I'd like to talk about trees. Uh, the project as designed uh, fails to fully comply with the requirements of the town's land use ordinance cluster development provisions. This, this is due to inaccuracies in the developer's tree survey, resulting in the failure to provide for the preservation of at least one significant tree on the proposed Lot 21. Uh, this is a copy of the developer's uh, tree uh, survey that was submitted. It was submitted for the sketch plan review, so it is also inaccurate in terms of lot lines because it includes the Kennebunk Port Land Conservation Tr Trust area. Uh, but in particular, uh, we'll be talking about the proposed Lot 21. Its old configuration is shown here. So. Uh, second would be traffic. Uh, there are serious deficiencies in developer's traffic study as well as significant safety issues with the site plan design. These deficiencies relate to the proposed access to Pinnacle Hill phases one and two because if you allow connection from Henshi Way through to Timberway, you're accessing both. <clears throat> from Kings Highway over Henshi Way as well as a major undercounting for the anticipated traffic volumes resulting from the proposed connection which Bill just spoke to. 
so I'd like to start with trees. Uh, with regard to my first point, section 7.2D, application requirements of subsection 14 of the Kennebunkport subdivision regulations requires the developer to submit the location of any existing large specimen trees defined as generally with a diameter of larger than 21 inches at breast height, or BDH. So if you're looking at this exhibit here, as you can see uh, both here and in this aerial overlay, uh, there's a very large Norway spruce in the middle of the proposed lot 21. So if you're looking here, this is lot 21 as redefined. That is the Norway spruce that you can see there. So um, with Mr. Bowie's permission, we hired a licensed arborist to measure the dimensions of the Norway spruce, and it measures at 21.4 inches at breast diameter height, thus qualifying as a large specimen tree. I find it interesting that it wasn't on there. Uh, additionally, there's also a maple tree that actually borders our lot line and Binnacle Hill. Uh, and it straddles our property line. This tree measures 24.5 inches at breast diameter height, and neither tree appears on the developer's survey, and no provision has been made for their guaranteed preservation. Uh, given the grades and the proximity of the wetlands to Lot 21, both these trees also provide for critical water management. So to point out again, this is the spruce, and then this is the large maple that straddle, neither of which appear here. So they'd be about right there. Okay. So the developer has designed Binnacle Hill Phases 1 and 2 under Section 7.4, Cluster Development of the Kennebunkport Land Use Ordinance. The cluster development provides for reduction in the minimum 40,000 square foot lot size required in the Goose Rock Zone in exchange for, among other things, a pattern of development which preserves trees, outstanding natural topography, and geologic geologic features that prevent soil erosion. The developer is benefiting from a significant reduction in the minimum lot size without affirming that they will definitively meet all the standards and purpose of the cluster provision. During the site walk on April 7th, the developer's attorney represented that they would endeavor to preserve trees. Clearly, it does not appear the developer plans to retain the Norway spruce as it was not shown in their submitted tree survey. A greater concern to the developer likely is that this tree's preservation would greatly restrict if not eliminate any building on the proposed lot 21, as you can see in the exhibit. You look this again, smack dab in the middle of the lot. So you preserve it, and you are not left with a lot. I would also like to note for the planning board that the developer's initial sketch plan submission envisioned only 12 lots in phase two. The plans is submitted for preliminary site plan approval provide for 13 lots. So at some point, this was a feasible development with only 12 lots. We're asking that the planning board enforce the cluster development provision with regard to significant tree preservation. Specifically, we ask the board to require the preservation of both the Norway spruce and the large maple tree that straddles lot 21 as a condition of any approval. And not wanting just to be a problem person, I have a potential solution that would allow both the preservation of the trees and for lot 21 to remain as a buildable lot. If you were to move the boundary of lot 21 to the west of the Norway spruce and swap a portion of the open space uh, in the preserved area to the west of the, with the easterly portion of 21, it could allow for build a lot. This is easier shown. Here. <laughs> if you look at lot 21 right here, this is preserved open space. You could modify the boundary here still have enough upland in lot 21, even though the land you'd be swapping is wet because there's a wetland that runs through it, you could still preserve a lot 21, allow the developer to have his lot and at the same time preserve the tree in accordance with the cluster provision. <clears throat> Second point, traffic. In our letter to the planning board dated March 7th, 2018, we outlined several issues with the developer's traffic study and the proposed design for Henshi Way, which you've had, heard a lot about tonight. Uh, first, the developer's traffic study is deficient on a number of counts. Uh, one, it was based on ITE standard trip generation rates versus actual trip counts. The IT standard rates are not appropriate for a seasonal summer community as they are based on typical to and from work trips. The standard IT, IT trip rates are also not reflective of much higher peak seasonal summer season trip rates. Mr. Bowley himself stated at the March 7th meeting that the homes would be primarily second homes 
and the traffic from Pinnacle Hill would not likely act according to standard ITE figures. We've already heard discussions about how much more convenient it would be for many of these homes in Pinnacle Hill to access Kings Highway, Sandpoint, and the beach via the proposed connection on Henshee Way. <clears throat> if you can also see here, you can see that cut through. You see all the homes to the east here. So, um, so secondly, the tra tra traffic study does not include any traffic from the 38 residents to the east on Kings Highway, nor does it include any trips from Binnacle Hill Phase 1. By connecting Henshee Way through to Binnacle Hill Phases 1 and 2, the developer will be creating a shortcut to the new Biddeford Road for traffic from the homes to the east on Kings Highway. It will also provide a shortcut for Binnacle Hill Phase 1 and traffic from new Biddeford Road heading to Kings Highway and Sand Point. The study does not account for what the ITE refers to as person trips, which also includes pedestrians and cyclists. And that's a big concern at the beach in the summer. Anyone who's been to Goose Rocks during a sunny summer weekend will attest to the traffic congestion along New Biddeford Road. This congestion starts near the current entrance to Binnacle Hill and continues through to the intersection of Kings Highway and Jeffreys Way and up Kings Highway. This congestion arises from both moving and parked cars, pedestrians, and cyclists and dogs. On peak weekends, this traffic spills down Kings Highway past Henshee Way with beach covers in search of parking spots. When the spaces are gone, cars currently turn around at the sewer pumping station. And we agree with Mr. Boak, who said both this evening and at the earlier planning board hearing on March 7th, that the proposed connection to phase two through Henshee Way would provide a, quote, new place for people to park on the connector all the way up to Timber Way. And as these are going to be private roads, you're putting the burden on the private property owners to enforce no parking. Also, we have to rent our home in order to, to, to uh, maintain it in the family, and that means our renters are going to be inconvenienced with people parking in front of the home illegally. Allowing a connection through Henshee Way to Binnacle Hill Phases 1 and 2 would provide a back way to access New Biddeford Road for homeowners and guests coming from the east of Binnacle Hill Phase 2. It would provide a cut through to access parking along Kings High Highway for seasonal beach parkers who will use Timber Way to Henshee Way. <coughs> it will significantly increase traffic on Henshee Way for beachgoers in search of parking spots. And it likely result in parking along Henshee Way, thus further narrowing the 18-foot travel lane, creating an unsafe situation. For these reasons, the study upon which the Henshee Way road improvements are designed is both inaccurate and inadequate. We request that the planning board require the developer to amend its traffic study to include actual peak season traffic counts and include cut through traffic in the analysis taking into consideration all the residences to the east on Kings Highway, the full impact of Binnacle Hill phases one and two, and traffic coming to the beach on New Bitterford Road. Third and most importantly, the proposed design of Henshee Way does not meet the requirements of the town subdivision ordinance. Specifically, the portion of Henshee Way that connects to Kings Highway does not have the requisite right-of-way. Furthermore, no sidewalk is proposed in that section. The 50-foot right-of-way required under the ordinance is also necessary to ensure no trespass over private property, both during construction by the developer and by others using the road. Additionally, the lack of a sidewalk would likely force pedestrians onto abutting property, again creating a situation of trespass as well as safety concerns. During the site walk on April 7th, the developer's engineer referenced the bridge on King's Highway to the west of Henshee Way as being the same width at 18 feet as the proposed section of Henshee Way that intersects with King's Highway. However, the bridge has a sidewalk, which Henshee Way would not have in the 20-foot section. If you spend any time on the beach in the summer, you know that this area is frequented by vehicles, bicycles, pedestrians, and small children going to and from the beach, and that the sidewalk on the bridge on King's Highway provides an important safety feature for pedestrians. Any of us who spend any time down there have seen kids with their bikes down the sidewalk crabbing over the bridge. So it is actively used. Further, Kings Highway meets the definition of a collector street under the town's subdivision ordinance. <laughs> Section 12.283 of the ordinance, which governs subdivisions entering onto a collector street, states, when the access to a subdivision is a street, the street design and construction standards of Section 12.2b below shall be met where there is a conflict between the standards in this section and the standards of section 12.2b, the more stringent shall apply. Table 12.2-3, the ordinance requires for private rights of way, a minimum right of way of 50 feet, a minimum traveled way of 18 feet, a minimum shoulder of three feet, and a minimum sidewalk of three feet. The developer cannot meet three of the above requirements. The developer's attorney has also stated that granting a waiver would be appropriate because doing so 
will it not impact the public health, safety, or welfare of the general <coughs> public or the residents of the subdivision in a long Henshi way? Developers' traffic study is insufficient to prove this point. Additionally, a traffic study based on actual peak summer counts may demonstrate that the roads through Binnacle Hill, if allowed to connect via Henshi Way to Kings Highway, would also meet collector street status, which is defined as, in part, a street with average daily traffic of 200 vehicles per day or greater. That's per day. And Bill said, he talked about morning trips to the beach and evening trips to the beach. If you have small children, there's the lunchtime trip to and from the beach as well. With 38 <coughs> properties to the east of Pinnacle Hill, 15 lots already approved in phase one, the 13 proposed lots in phase two, and three existing homes along Henshi Way and Kings Highway at the intersection of the V, we're at 69 homes, not taking into consideration other traffic coming from New Biddeford Road traveling to the beach. This clearly will generate far more traffic than the developer's traffic study indicates. Mr. Argu Austin has also argued in his letter to the Planning Board that Kings Highway itself is substandard. Rather, we would argue that two wrongs do not make a right. Allowing the developer to connect a King's Highway via substandard roadway design should not be approved, nor should the planning board rely on the developer's traffic study as submitted. Lastly, Mr. Austin stated that it would be reasonable to grant a waiver to allow for secondary access or egress to Pinnacle Hill Lane for emergency reasons. We disagree. The developer had no concerns building phase one with 15 lots with no secondary access. In fact, they sought a waiver for the dead end road length. You can see here. Um, excuse me. Um, additionally, the developer has a lot of New Biddeford Road to the east of Phase 1 under agreement that could also be used to provide an alternate access. It doesn't give you a lot, but it does provide more. So they control this lot here. That's under agreement with the Gaylords as well. So they own additional property on New Biddeford Road that because it's already an approved lot, it's not part of the subdivision approval because it exists. But that could also be used as a secondary egress if necessary. Uh -huh. So section 12.2 B1A general requirement states, the board shall not approve any subdivision plan unless the proposed streets are designed in accordance with any local ordinance or the specifications contained in these regulations. For these reasons, we ask the board not to allow any connection of Binnacle Hill phases one or two to Henchy Way. Given the amount of developable uplands, Timber Way could be redesigned as a dead end cul-de-sac with no connection to Henchy Way. The remaining Gaylor property could be developed as an additional lot on the site of the former Ritchie home with no improvements to Henshi Way required. So while they're currently showing four lots closer to the end of Henshi Way, they can do one additional lot there with no changes to Henshi Way. Once they get to four lots, Henshi Way meets the standards of a private road and therefore has to meet the 50-foot right-of-way width, sidewalk, et cetera, full to full length. Wow. So in summary, we request that the planning board require the developer to comply with section 7.2D of the subdivision regulations and provide for protection and preservation of both the Norway spruce and the maple tree by adjusting the lot 21 boundaries. Leaving significant trees on private property lots will not guarantee their preservation. There have been far too many cut and fine incidents in the state where homeowners remove their trees only to face insignificant fines. The state law carries a fine of only $125 for felling a tree between 18 and 22 inches. Carving these trees out of the lot is the only way to ensure their preservation in accordance with the regulations of the uh, ordinance. Any homeowner who's going to spend $450,000 to $550,000 for a lot in Binnacle Hill Phase 2 will gladly pay a fine to improve their view by eliminating that tree. We request that the planning board require the developer to resubmit its traffic study using actual peak summer counts. Lastly, we ask that the Planning Board affirm and uphold the requirements of both the Land Use Ordinance and the Subdivision Ordinance and not approve a connection of Phase 2 to Henshi Way as the proposed streets cannot be designed in accordance with the ordinance and specifications contained in the town's regulations. We also ask the board that the board not grant the developer any waivers for construction of improvements on Henshi Way. Granting such a waiver would actually negatively impact the safety and welfare of the general public and the residents along Henshi Way by creating a substandard and unsafe condition. Thank you for your time, your attention, and especially for your service. Uh, any questions of Ms. Miller? <clears throat> um, I'm, I'm having a hard time trying to fr frame a precise question. Let's, let's stay away from the um, interpretation 
of the articles, but rather on your understanding and impressions as a resident there of the safety issue. You, you said that, lastly, the, the ordinance was the most important point, but it seems to me that the safety is the, the okay. most important point. It is. If you can't design the road in, a road in accordance with what the town is deemed to be safe standards, your ordinance exists because you've deemed that to be the safe construction method. As, as, your, as a resident there, suppose just hypothetically that you terminated in, in a cul-de-sac and you didn't allow a connection with Henchy Way. Now you have all these people that are, that are living in that development. Um, how are the children that are with those families that are either renting there or, or living there during the summer, how, how will they get to the beach if they don't take their vehicles? If they don't take their vehicles, yeah. <clears throat> they can do what other people, most people do take their vehicles and they do drop off. So you'll see, um, if, you're, if you spend any time at the beach, you watch people drive down from say King's Grand area, they drive to the beach, uh, some of them have stickers, so if they get there early enough, they get a parking spot, they, or they unload their things, they turn around and they come back home. So, uh, so that's, that's not a problem? That they just go out the other entrance. So there's yeah, no, so they could drive no, out the no other entrance. No safety issue there. They could what also about the take, kids on their bicycles? Their if they took their bikes on on the entrance, they would go down the road, which has sidewalks uh, in their subdivision, along to uh, the new Bitterford Road, which does not, but it has a paved shoulder. And I think it's up to parents to determine whether the children are of an age where it's safe to let them ride by themselves along New Bitterford Road. To me, if I was a kid in that community, I'd be, I'd be riding my bike down over the cul-de-sac, and I'd be going out Henchy Way. You know, a bike That's would a be practical a, a bike is probably not going to be a safety concern for us. Is it going to be more traffic than what we're used to? Sure, but we don't. We don't own. We're not opposed to the development of this property. We don't own the 26 acres abutting. What we are opposed to is having it developed in such a means means that pro, uh, re, that proposes on us a safety issue. But, but but the safety issue you're speaking of, see, you seem to be making the point that the safety issue is not meeting this, the land use ordinance. It is the volume of traffic that the developer's traffic study <coughs> has accounted for. So you're talking about in, uh, much higher numbers of cars there and then putting them through, through a sub-standard standard section of road. Okay, okay. So you think ve vehicle, vehicle collisions? You have, if you have two cars, if, say you have a municipal, well, they'll have to have private waste haulers because it's a private road. Uh, you have a private trash truck, you have a regular truck, you've got a bike, you've got a kid, or you've got someone w walking their dog to the beach. There's not enough room for that. So, and if so, you went on the site okay. walk, you'll see the triangular portion right. that the Fetzer zoned is heavily treed. So there's lots of bushes there. Um, so it's not I, easy I for it. someone to step there. I got it. So, so your, your point would be that normal access, normal ingress and egress through that would, would give rise to an increased volume of traffic and therefore potential for collisions either between vehicles or with vehicles and pedestrians. Yeah. If it were turned into a emergency vehicle only, Crash gate, I think, was the unfortunate term that we <laughs> <laughs> applied to that. Uh, those concerns seem to go away. If it depends. It would depend on how it's designed and where it's designed. Oh, obviously, obviously, right. devils um, in the you know, details. Needed, but you know, but, but you, you think that the safety concerns would go away, as would the cut through with an emergency only access through Henshaw. Yeah, Bank. if you leave this road in its predominant current condition, it's not going to be attractive for people to use as a cut through, particularly or, or as a pathway. So even if it's nicely paved, uh, yeah, if, you know, if it if it doesn't go and, through and that raises a whole other host of issues. There is no agreement for Rehenshi Way right now. Um, the the owners of the property haven't paid a dime one of maintenance for the property in the last five years. Since Babbitt donated his house for a burn exercise to the town. He's not contributed to any plowing or road maintenance. The Fetzners and the Millers have paid for everything. Um, there is no agreement. Pinnacle Hill is a very um, detailed, recorded um, uh, owner's association agreement. We have no interest in being part of that, and I don't want to be forced into being part of that. Uh, we're here. We shouldn't have to pay for the pavement, pay for whatever uh, that happens on the road because they improved it for Pinnacle Hill. I I'm realized, not part of Pinnacle Hill. I hadn't Hill. realized that was, that was a proposal. Uh, they, their home, they have a homeowners association that governs the maintenance and expense of the private roads that they developed. They're proposing to create a private road uh, uh, and connect through us uh, as well. And, and we're not part of that homeowners association, nor do we have any desire to be. We have not asked to be part of Pinnacle Hill. I don't want to incur higher maintenance costs. If I have neighbors up the hill who are spending half a million dollars on the lot, I can only imagine what they're spending on their home. So what's not a lot of money to them is a lot of money to us. No, I, we I, have I, to rent our home to keep it. But basically, you don't have to become part of that homeowner's uh, That's what I'm saying. I'm hoping not. 
No, no one so. can force you into becoming right. part of that homeowner's. And in many ways, that would take the cost off you for maintaining the road. Assuming it's maintained properly. So once it's paved, you have potholes, you have other issues. We also have no say to ensure that it's maintained properly. That's you true. Can, you, don't you can't have it both ways. I get that. But, it, you know, it's something to think about. That's true. But it's the owner's right to go ahead and pave so. it. Um, your view easement, what's the area it extends to? So... Is it the edges of your property? And no, it's all straight. the way over to, it's to the ocean across the property, um, owned by the developer, but essentially if you look at it, it's this section here. So this section here is, would be subject to our view rights. But it doesn't come, it doesn't come down it, uh, into the Fesner's part no, of it. No, So It that, stops there. So, so if lighting... This is our property line right here. Right. That's a shoreland zone yep. line, so it's here across the field. Okay, so if somebody put lighting on either side, you, that's not going to affect your view easement. I don't, I don't, no, if it's, if it's off, if it's off that, out of that view section, mm -hmm. no. Okay. And, you know, I would argue that if they wanted to, if they have, if this road is allowed to, uh, to go through, which I hope it's not because of the reasons I stated before, there are in-ground low-level lighting fixtures that you can put in sidewalks. They're like half shelves um, that provide lighting at, at, at Yeah, but that, that, that doesn't really light up for a pedestrian very well. It, it's actually designed for pedestrian pathways. I'd be happy it, to share it. I understand it. I've seen okay. it for pedestrian pathways, but I'm talking about people going up the road toward the development and so forth. You might need something higher up that directs and, and gives you the view, extends out the view uh, at night. And that's what um, we're concerned about. We're concerned about light pollution over our view <coughs> easement. Well, that's not going to affect your view easement because the lighting wouldn't be where your depends, easement it is. It depends on the fixture design. Sharp cutoff fixture and depending on where it was located and where the, fix, and where the fixtures were and the design of the fixture. Right. But the light could be directed over the road there. Okay. Are there any other We've questions? Got Ten more minutes. See ya. Um, and I, the, I'm sure the public hearing will continue. Are there other members of the public who wish to speak? Sure. And if I thought I could make it till ten, but I can't, so I'm going to run to the restroom real quick. <laughs> <laughs> so. Can you take me a minute? No, please go right ahead. <clears throat> Paul Hogan, uh, 324 Kings Highway. I'm just beyond uh, Henchy Way, right beyond the field. Um, and since we were just discussing lighting, um, I'll take us back to Binnacle Hill 1, speaking of properly designed lighting. That's totally defective. Um, I came up New Biddeford Road the first time the lighting went on, middle of the winter, you know, I was just cruising along at night, like 10 o'clock at night, cruising along, and um, I jammed on my brakes, stopped, because I thought there was a big truck coming out, and I'm like, what is a truck doing coming out of Binnacle Hill? There's not a house there, you know, at 10 o'clock at night. Um, it turns out the spotlights, which illuminate that beautiful sign, not, um, <laughs> shine all the way across the street, all the way across New Biddeford Road into the property. I'm sure the, when the homeowners arrive in the season, they won't really want their side yard lit. Um, I'm sure that was not what was, what was intended, but, but some that's, designer. That's not the kind of lighting that you see in a subdivision. A spotlight is not what you have. What you have no, is something. You just approved Binnacle Hill it, 1. So, he's talking so about what's you, there now. I'm talking about what was designed in Binnacle Hill 1. There are two lights, which are very tasteful, that are street lights, and I'm very happy they're not in the middle of the field. Um, that, that there was a good design, one out by the street, one up by the bluff. Um, but then there's a big, um, because I guess we don't have ordinances about what signage is allowed in a residential zone. Um, but there's a you know, beautiful sign, a lot, of, a lot of money went into it, but the illumination of it is like a supermarket. And it shines all the way across the street. Go by some night. Take a drive. It's a beautiful spot. Um, but that, that's sort of off to the side. But since the chairman wasn't here, 
Um, <laughs> Okay. So I, I did send a note to Werner right after I saw it. I didn't get any response. Yeah. Um, I did. So I, I don't know whether. Yeah, I did. So I forwarded uh, your comments to the police department uh, and asked the police chief to weigh in. And uh, and and I'm happy to you know to share a copy of his response. Uh, Jeff, he, did you think it's? Have you gone by at night? He, he did not share the same concerns, uh, you know, regarding the safety, uh, any safety elements. Uh, but with regard to the spotlight or the, the lights that were illuminated. But it should <coughs> hit a sign, shine back. How far is that sign from the street, Jeff? I don't know. Off the head. 40 feet? I don't know. And then cross the street, which is 30 feet, and into a neighbor's yard. That, it just concerns me when we say oh, we're going to have beautiful lighting, it's not going to bother anybody. Um, we, we just saw what happened. I'm sure it can be fixed. The wattage can be reduced, and the sign can still be seen at nighttime. Um, anyway, what I wanted to uh, talk about now that the chairman's back. Um, Sorry. Did the, um, and I haven't been able, I guess it's not posted online. I don't know whether, in the sake of transparency, it could be like when we do a peer review, how do we know? You can certainly come by, and we'll provide you I know, copies. But how would I, would I come and visit Lisa every day? Um, is, did anything come back yet? I mean, when an agenda is sent out, why not, why not provide it? It would just be a great thing to do. So I don't know the answer to this question. Um, and the question is, uh, just towards my house, uh, there's a pump-out station um, right down at the street. It runs on a diesel, very loud uh, engine, uh, about once a week in season, less, less frequently off-season. And does the, does, the, does the peer review study address that and whether that's going to have to run more? I have no idea how far it shoots the stuff, uh, whether all this other stuff coming down the hill is going to... So the, the generator there is, is a backup. And so what you're hearing, you know, what you're hearing is just... And smelling. I have to close my house windows, <laughs> literally, in the summer. So when, when this thing goes, when the generator runs, it's just it's part of a it's it's very much like your you know like any other typical generator that has a preset time in which it comes on and it runs for a set period of time. You know, for those of you who have whole house generators, uh, you all experience you know many of you experience the same thing. You know, the generators are set to run uh, for a predetermined amount of time, but it's it's there as a backup. It's there in, in the case of a power outage. Uh, you know, it's not. So why does it run like five hours? Well, you know that that's a you know a question that I would uh, that I'd put forward to Mike Claus. You know, okay, to I'll ask do that. as far as you know what why the amount of time. You know, in terms of so it should uh, have no impact operation. upon that. Is what you're saying? Yeah, uh, it, it's you know my understanding is that you know those generators are are in place you know for whenever you have power outages. Got it. Got it. Um, I, I think uh, since Jeff, I mean, I think just one other thing, the traffic, and I know this has been um, gone over, but because on New Bitterford Road, there's no parking except one way away from the beach, um, no sane person is going to come down to New Bitterford Road and go to the beach this way. They're going to try to come down this way, um, unload at the intersection, like many people do already. Um, and then hope to find a parking spot on the right-hand side. It would be perfect um, all the way up. There's 30-some-odd spots uh, from the corner up to the, you know, through the field. Um, so that would be the normal, sensible thing to do. So I do think a lot of traffic will be created. Um, those are often early in the morning, a drop off the car, um, and then the walkers, you know, the rest of people wake up out of the house, and then people come with their small stuff. Um, so I do think there will be a lot of one way that way. Um, that's it. Thanks. Thank you. Evening, everybody. Um, I won't take long. Um, Ray Lockhart from one to Biddeford and um, some tough acts to follow here. So um, um, I won't attempt to uh, I won't attempt to do that. Um, just just a couple of things. One is I wanted to address there, there was a a lot of conversation tonight about around you know additional emergency vehicle access to, to this one portion of the development. Now, phase one is a one-way cul-de-sac, 
Um, and I don't know if I, I wasn't a, a party to those discussions, but we, we seem to be very focused on emergency vehicles for the, the 13 parcels here and the length of this road. Abernathy uh, way or lane just down the road, fairly new development. I mean, not, you know, not ancient is a, is a one way in, and, and I don't know that they have a lot of problems with trees or moose sitting in front of the road and you can't get there or, or whatever. Um, so I, I would just say that I, 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 I'm a little bit, I, I guess, questioning a bit that there's, it, was there an incident recently or something that's sort of driving us or maybe just something that just caught everybody's attention. And um, I certainly don't think it, it justifies in, a, in one particular instance focusing on that uh, uh, in support of this um, variance or, or uh, I'm sorry, I'm missing the term this late at night, mm -hmm. um, uh, to allow this to go through and, and use that as, as a basis because I think I, I feel like it's a bit of a one-off. Um, and then just to echo some of the safety concerns as well. I mean, I, we, I'm not going to go all the way through it, but what you've heard from, from the folks tonight that have spent a lot of time at the beach, a lot longer than, than my wife and I have, um, but we see every day um, at, at New Bedford is um, the, the traffic, the kids, the bikes, the unloading, um, and, you know, um, what, what Paul alluded to, you know, in my opinion, is exactly what's going to happen and, and what I would do and, um, you know, uh, living all the way up here, all the way through, you know, it would make the most sense, come down to the beach, especially come down early, unload, grab a spot on the road. I, I don't think people are going to necessarily always drive back and then walk back and back and forth, and that's, and that's fine. It's all, within, it's all within the rules, but it's going to create a lot of additional traffic. So I just wanted to echo the, the sentiments that I don't think the normal, normal algorithms and thoughts around traffic patterns in this particular instance um, you know, really hold any weight. It's, very, it's really a very unique situation as a beach community, and then in this particular instance, because of the focus on the beach access at that end of the beach and, and Jeffrey's really being um, the sole access for quite a bit of the beach there, it, it does create quite, quite a funnel um, and will be an additional funnel um, for this part of the development. That's what I want to add tonight. Thank you. Just to clarify, you're saying that opening a connection <clears throat> through Henchy Way is going to generate more traffic. Uh, what, what I'm saying is that it's going to it's going to create additional congestion, I believe, down here at the end. And in addition to the safety concerns that uh, that have already been raised, which I said I, I, again, because, I don't want to echo. Because there there would be you're going to have additional traffic coming, cars. correct? Down from th you, through you, Henchy Way, and you're going to get the traffic the, regardless. But what you're going to get is traffic coming down in, in an area where there's already parking on one on one side of the street and it's congested. You have the bridge at the one end. We've already talked about Kings Highway, and and it's it's a little bit smaller. It's anyway, the same amount of traffic, but coming from two directions is, I, is what you're. I, I don't know if I'm going to speak to the same amount of traffic because I don't know what people's options are going to be coming or going. You know, I will tell you that when when New Biddeford piles up in in the one direction, um, it, it's it's not a it, it's going to be congested. I think, and what folks are going to realize when, if this is open, it's going to be a natural draw to come through your ease, you know, your private road, which is going to be less congested, and come down into the bottom end of Kings Highway here, um, because you're not going to deal with the normal holiday traffic. Mm -hmm. It's just, it's just going to be a nat normal well, consequence. It's what I would do, frankly, I, if I, I was understand. there. So, so it's just having the additional path. I, I believe the, so. Is the concern. Thank you. Sure. <clears throat> I think to one of your questions about the cul-de-sac and, and why the argument for not having an, a second would be that when you layer single road cul-de-sacs on a development with a single road cul-de-sac, you sometimes could compound safety or security issues because you're limiting them to one, one way in and one way out. Um, so I think that's part of the argument I've heard from the applicant is that that extra area there um, relieves that uh, in that regard. And I know that, um, how many fire hydrants are in phase one? Is it two? I think it's two. Yeah, and I, I think initially it was proposed as one. Um, and that's another reason. I, I think I even joked at the time, Alan Moyer, rest his soul, initially said maybe just put one, and I joked saying he's not the guy hauling a thousand foot of hose down the road. Um, so two are there, and we appreciate that. Um, so that's just one thought in that area. Um, and I'll let you go too, but the, um, what strikes me is the, the discussion around the parking piece, and I, it's, you're all closer to it than I. I live a mile away, and I drop people off, go home, and I ride a bike down, because I never, I get frustrated trying to find parking. Um, so it really strikes me as being like, man, if I live there, I don't think I'd ever even start my car on the weekend, I would just walk <laughs> to the beach. Um, but you're closer to it, and you see different things than I see. 
<laughs> no, I, I drop everything off and then I go home and go. Hi, um, my name is Teresa Henchy De Benedictus um, from 10 Ocean View. It's a family property that I own with my two brothers, um, obviously namesake Henchy Way. Um, so a lifetime spent here hoping to be able to <coughs> live here year round when, when my, tur my turn comes, but it's uh, we hold this place dear um, in our hearts going back more than 100 years. Um, I have con some concerns. We are, as I said, 10 Ocean View, so we're on the other, we're on the other side. We don't, our property doesn't exactly touch Henshi Way, but we overlook it across from the uh, Millers. Um, so one uh, concern that folks have talked about is uh, light pollution. Um, I don't, I see sort of an uh, inverse issue with the street lights that it's, it's, a, it's a glorified driveway now is all it's been for many, many moons and no lights are needed to come and go at all hours, walking, driving, that you, you're gonna widen it, you're, you're, you know, you're just inviting more versus the current sort of traffic calming layout that you have that's there. Yes, you're gonna hook it into the back side, but I, I would urge less is more in this situation rather than putting in street lights and, you know, <clears throat> the wonderful night sky that we have like no other places when you're up here and you can see the Milky Way. It's, it makes the place special and bringing street lights, I just don't see an upside to that at all. Um, I am concerned about changing the layout as contemplated of Henshi Way versus its traditional layout now. Um, it moves it closer to the wetlands that are up at the top that run between our property and Babex. So when you're, the more you come in that direction, you're getting closer and closer to the wetlands there versus the layout where it is now is further away, about maybe 50 feet or so, it, it would be close to the wetlands at the top. So that's a concern of ours as well. Um, let me take a look at my notes. I, our, I don't know, our sewer line comes off the front of our property and goes into that manhole that's in Henshi Way. Um, so we're concerned about it not being crushed by heavy equipment during construction and vehicles coming in and out. So I don't know whether you can make it in your um, findings. What I would like is if our, our sewer line were TV'd from the manhole up to the clean out on our property, TV'd before construction and after construction and that we'd be given a copy of the film so that, because you could have a, the sewer line be cracked during construction and we wouldn't know for 15 years down the line that it happened during construction. So like you get with a, a blast mm. uh, survey before, I'd like that to be done to make sure that our sewer line doesn't get ruined in, in the process of the homes being built. Uh, one, I couldn't tell what the side setback might be of these houses at the top in relation to the property line and how close they might be on that side. I couldn't, I couldn't get a good, good uh, the documentation wasn't helpful to see what, how close those would be to our home. Um, it's at the top, but that's obviously, we, I don't know if uh, folks have a long view of Goose Rocks, the, our property at 10 Ocean View used to be at the bottom of the hill where that giant oak tree is and the rock cluster. Mm -hmm. That tree was behind the cottage. The cottage was on top of the rock clump, which was in our basement for lack of a better term. And it got picked up by a crane around about 1978 and driven up the hill and plunked on its foundation. So we were trying to move away from neighbors and now they're following us up the hill. So <laughs> we like where Henshi Way is, right where it is now. The layout, I think, serves what, what was there and would serve in the future. 
whoever lives and is a neighbor, and we'd be happy to meet all folks that get to move to this wonderful place. I don't remember if you were at the site walk, but <clears throat> I think it was your house somebody was referencing as far as car headlights shining in and asked if there could be a buffer or something planted. I don't know if that was your house. I, um, I wasn't able to make the somebody um, had site walk. That. You, you, that was you. Um, but certainly, like, there's a, there's a great buffer there now, and there's a lot of plantings, and I assume a lot of trees are going to come out of there that have grown since the fire of 47. So most of those trees are are pretty old at this point, and we're used to having either one neighbor, my aunt and uncle, um, that back we thought was gonna be our neighbor, but that's not how it worked out. Um, it's quiet and wonderful up there, and we're, obviously there's gonna be more neighbors there, but it's, it's of concern. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thank you. We're getting paid time and a half now. But. Yeah, thanks. Hey, sorry, uh, Paul Hogan, I forgot one point, um, and that is um, the bottom <coughs> of uh, this intersection um, and the Fetzner property um, are flooded much of the time. So I have to go out all winter um, and ax pick through the, uh, the snow, and in the summer dig out, this is on John Coyne's land and the trust is not my property. But I do it because um, on both sides of the bridge, because it's low land on both sides of the bridge, a tremendous amount of water comes down. Um, it floods that area all the time. When Mrs. Miller was alive, she would have the road crew come out. Um, but it's, you know, it's a very depressed area. And my concern is with more impervious surface, going to be more water rushing down faster down the hill into that spot. Um, it's a problem, you know, any heavy rain. Uh, in the summertime, it's a nuisance. In the winter, it's dangerous. Um, and it can get, you know, three or four or five inches. Mm. Um, but it's really a town issue, I think, as opposed to, but it's going to become worse as a result of this. <coughs> okay. <coughs> so we're after 10 PM. Um, I. There's a lot going on around the peer review, some responses required. There's potentially some additional discussion that will take place. Um, we have a lot of notes here from the public hearing. Um, I'm of the opinion that we keep the public hearing open because there'll be some new information um, that will be shared or answered. I will say that when we've done this in the past, we just ask that if you have any new concerns that um, those are brought forth and we don't rehash old hash. Um, um, so does that, is there a consensus that, yeah. yeah, yeah. Did you raise your hand, Rob? I know, yeah. I mean, one, we certainly agree with keeping the public hearing open. That's not, not an issue because there will be different uh, information coming back. Um, I know the board obviously can't even take a vote on anything, and we don't expect that, but if we could get some guidance of a, of a consensus on what the board is thinking about the Hinchy Way. That's the big issue, obviously, yeah. the Hinchy Way. Um, and it would just help us in design to sure. get a sense of where the board's leading tonight, knowing that you're not bound because yep. there'll be more information <clears throat> coming in. We'll start down. Yeah. I guess I'm, I'm struck by the differences in the traffic stories that I'm hearing. Um, I think the, the original traffic report, uh, there was a question about the fact that it sort of uh, treated these as residences where people were going to commute in the morning and then come home from their jobs at night. And everyone realized that maybe that didn't really fit the demographic. So, so then I have a, a peer review traffic study from um, T.Y. Lynn. And it says, well, there's a really good trouble with the demographic, but I still, even if it's going to be recreation-based, I see approximately 13 peak hour trips. And you don't have, to, at least, I'm, I'm no traffic expert, but there's more than 13 lots in phase one and phase two that all would take the shortest path to drop their car off at the beach. It seemed like 
that seemed to be an underestimate as well to me. I don't have a chance to talk to the people that generated this. So, um, and and then I heard some, what to me was, maybe compelling is too strong a word, but certainly significant argument that said, look at even if it's the same amount of traffic, you've got two different paths, making it converge on a on a very busy point already. There's a, there's a real issue with, with opening up this path <coughs> to bypass New Biddeford Road to, to a point of intersection. And, and that got me worried that says maybe that safety concern is going to outweigh this concern with having an alternate entry in, into the Binnacle Hill for the safety of the residents. So, so that's what's troubling me right now. T to me, if, if I... And, and, and that's not going to be fixed by widening the right-of-way to 50 feet either. It's, it's really a simple matter of, of the geometry of the, of the roads there. That, that it strikes me that you either, if that's real, then, then you're either going to have a, a cul-de-sac or an emergency access only situation. I do think the solution for the benefit of selling those lots and for the reality of what people do needs to undertake a pedestrian access from the new Binnacle Hill development down to the, to the beach. That's going to let people, kids on their bikes, and people pulling their strollers or whatever it is, take those secondary trips home at lunchtime or whatever. And, you know, it's a nice community right of way. And no one's going to use that. If, if there's no vehicle cut through, no one's going to use that but the residents. And it could be nice. I'm not sold on the lighting business. I, I kind of like the idea that it's a beach community and it, you know, my recollections of the beach at night, I take my flashlight and it's kind of part of the charm of it, given that the town kept the place safe. So, so that's my feeling right now, is I, I think it seems to me to be a struggle to, to have that secondary entrance. I'd like to hear the town attorney weigh in before I make any final decision. But um, I, I think I know Goose Rocks very well. I've been to the beach there for many years. You know, I, I haven't for the last couple of years. But basically, it's it's a community that's to me is overgrown, if anything, um, and you're adding more houses and development, which is you're right. Um, and everybody wants to go to the beach. And in the summer, there are more pedestrians and bicycles on there than there are vehicles. Um, you know, and parking is a big problem. Um, I gave up parking there, even with a handicap sticker. Mm -hmm. and, uh, yeah. and I just had my husband drop me off if I want to go to the beach there. Um, I know that area. I know it's, it's old roads. They're difficult because the King's Highway was basically put in when the King was there, <laughs> you know, <laughs> and it's, it's got the usual growing pains of a place that's been there for many, many, you know, for a couple hundred years and has, has, has grown and, and has a very, very big community at this point for a little beach. Um, I think you could find a way really for an emergency access only for vehicles, but I'd like to see it made into a walking path, basically. Um, and, you know, have that access, I think, is important. Um, whether or not you move the lot, 21 or not, and I'm all for big trees. I'm part of the shade tree committee. You know, I, I cherish them. <laughs> and I plant more. <laughs> and I restrict anybody from cutting down trees, and my fines would be a lot more than 150 bucks. <laughs> uh, I mean, I know of one case in England where they charged someone $60,000 because that's the uh, amount that he improved his lot by taking down a tree illegally. They take it seriously there. So. Anyway, um, but, um, you know, before anything, I, I would like to see the access problem worked out. Uh, give some real thought into it. And I don't believe in two cul-de-sacs there. I, you know, I've read enough about the f fire of 47. I'm working on town forests now that are overgrown from that. And I know how fast fires can move through a place. I'd like to see some sort of emergency um, way out of there. I, I think in a, in a community that has so many people, even if it's 
down to a lot less in the winter, you still need some sort of emergency access roads mm -hmm. for people to get in and out with not just one access. So I don't know how to, you know, I don't know what to say in that. You know, I think you ought to plan a little bit around that. That's the feedback. Yeah. Um, so I tend to agree with Nina. Um, I'm not a favor of, you know, another extended road with a cul-de-sac off of, albeit a short stint, but an extended road with a cul-de-sac. Um, I appreciate the discussions that you shared or the information you shared about discussions that have, have taken place um, leading up to now. Um, so I, I would just, I would like, I guess, to hear when, you know, when a, a, a final applications presented or the final options presented that all options have been pursued and we were either you know successful <clears throat> and this is there's a swap happening and this is the way it'll it, you know it will occur or we pursued and you know we just weren't able to reach agreement and this is what we're asking the board to do um, you know to Nina's point I, I think access from there for emergency purposes is very important um, I think that it would be nice if folks living there could, you know, and travel through there to access the beach. Um, I, ideally, in my opinion, I'd like to see, if it was at all possible, to see a proper and, and safe um, roadway come through there and, and come down into the Kings Highway area, um, if at all possible, if, if parties could agree to something like that. Oh, I, I'm, I kind of agree with everybody else that uh, somehow m making it emergency access, I, it would have to be an improved road to be. I mean, mm -hmm. you can't go rolling up the dirt road at you know a little hill at the end end of the Miller's driveway. I mean, it'd have to be a little bit better than that. And it would again, it would be nice <coughs> as a. Uh, pedestrian walkway. I guess if Nina mentioned something about legality and whether do we have is there something we have to ask Amy yeah. about this specifically? Yeah, yeah, there's a big yeah. Whether we could grant a waiver if we made it for vehicles on private roads and uh, how the <coughs> subdivision works <coughs> work with Well we've already asked her the to address Yes. That letter. And that's it. Yes. And okay. that's what it that's is. The that's, all right, that's fine. Good. Not anything further that you, than we've already asked. No. no. Okay. Sorry. Yeah, I, I would agree that I'm a little undecided. Uh, with I like Nina's points. Uh, I, I think the um, crash gate idea with the road, sure, it should be approved, but I, I'd like to keep it gravel. Um, not necessarily paved, just to kind of go with the atmosphere of the neighborhood. Um, but a lot of it hinges on the waiver aspect, like Nina said. So that's really, I, I wish I could be more definitive as to how I feel, but um, I just want to kind of sort that out in my mind about the waiver situation. Let me just re, re add a fine point to, to my earlier statement. If the traffic concern that we heard tonight is legitimate, and, and again, I'm not a long-term Goose Rocks knowledgeable person. I'm, I'm in Kennebunkport a little over a year now, so I just am walking around with my eyes open. I, I know it's busy. But, but if it's real, if you are going to have pass-through traffic there, then it's going to be a concern to people that are going to buy those lots. Maybe not the first person that buys a lot, but the second or the third, and it, it, it's part of your marketing consideration as well, uh, how, how you deal with that. If, if you're setting yourself up, it's something to think about. Okay. okay. Um, so we'll... So there's nobody else to talk. We'll continue the public. <coughs> we'll continue. And so folks here tonight and, and who are not here tonight are welcome to return. So the meeting um, will continue this. Um, it'll <coughs> remain as a preliminary subdivision review 
and continuation of the public hearing. Um, and we hope that, really hope that um, Amy will have had a chance yeah. to provide us something before that that next meeting. And hopefully, uh, the, some of, some of the issues. Yeah, in a summary of any progress made to, to shrink the, the, right. the, the list. The staff comments and the two the two period. Yeah. Okay. Do we need to Russ? Do you this? do you reach out to Amy, or is, is that something no, you do we'll, through? No, we take care of that. Okay. Yep. Thank yeah. you. Yeah. So we'll follow up. We'll, we'll follow up to, with her. To, yep. to, to continue the public hearing okay. the next yeah. time. Okay. Vote on it. Yeah. Yeah. I'll make a motion to continue the public hearing. I'll second. All those in favor? Opposed. Um, so yeah, we in our. You know, this is going to be very boring for you if you want to stick around. Um, in our effort to get going on, the, on that one, we forgot to vote on the findings of fact. We signed them. Um, so I'll make a motion to, uh, to approve the findings of fact as amended, as read and amended by the board. Sandy Pines? On Sandy yes. Pines, yes. Second. Oh, second? Yes. All those in favor? Yes. Opposed? Yes. Member? Yeah. Okay. Get to okay. <laughs> Usually you give me a wave or something, but I, I, I to make more change. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> and I would like to make a motion we adjourn. Adjourn. I'll second. All, All in favor? favor? <laughs>